the really exciting thing about this course is that we're able to make these really fun games like this maze game here, um, all while learning Java programming basic concepts. And I'll be going through uh, not just these tutorials, but also notes, vocabulary, things like that. But here's an example right here. Here we have our class dog. And within the class of dogs, we can have multiple different dogs. These dogs can be different breeds, ages, colors, sizes, but they all have some of the similar behaviors. They all can bark, sleep, eat. In the yellow box up there, I've programmed out what it would look like to create class dog with the different fields. Um, and I've created a new Chihuahua and a new Husky. Um, so two different instances of the class dog. So we have the Chihuahua and the Husky. I deliberately set up this course so that we can go two notes back into making our game and back and forth, not only so you stay engaged and, and have a lot more fun, but also so we break down some of these concepts into more manageable chunks that we can retain. Then here we have our Flappy Bird game where we are bouncing along, hitting the space bar and trying to jump through these pipes. Um, it's a great way of using gravity as well as a score counter within our game programming. Now I'm going to show you guys an example of how I explain myself while we're creating these games and I'm not just showing you guys how to do it, but I'm explaining the reasoning behind it. And here's an example of our snake game because we're getting a cur the current world, which is my world. We're creating a reference for it. Okay, so we can go into my world. We can access blue counter because that is a method in my world. And then within that, that reference references to the counter class, which has our add score method for our blue counter. So now you can see if I move my score out a little bit, my score for the blue counter going up. Um, if you notice, there's multiple players. Um, I use the arrow keys in WASD to battle each other and see who wins. And last but not least, we have the piano project. We will be using loops and arrays to build a full functioning piano. Now this preview focused mainly on the activities that we're going to do. Um, I left some notes before the comments section. And I spent a ton of time on this course really trying to perfect it and organize it in a way that uh, helps beginning Java learner the best it can. So please, if you're interested, go ahead and start taking the course. And if you like what you hear, feel free to like, subscribe, or leave a comment at the bottom of the page. Here are some of the main programming topics we're going to cover. Um, we have classes, both sub and super classes, objects, methods, Java and Greenfoot libraries, um, inheritance, variables and data types, uh, if, else if, and nested if statements, loops and nested loops, arrays and lists, and um, some other game programming skills. And down below we have a picture of uh, the standards that we follow along the high school curriculum that I'm using, and a little bit closer look at that. We explore what object-oriented programming means and apply some of those principles into the games that we create um, by using the integrative development environment, uh, using Java language and documentation, uh, as well as even going into Eclipse uh, at parts to explain uh, how it would look in Java as opposed to Greenfoot. We use game development tools and, and I'll use uh, industry standard language and making sure that we are using uh, Java conventions and um, using object oriented principles. Controlled data flow using scope and variables, parameters, inheritance, and encapsulation. Um, using private, public, static, void, and non-void methods. And not only that, but also some game design functions, uh, make objects move, turn, have a scorekeeping mechanism, a timer, design and create a fully functional game, control game operations uh, using the keyboard, enhance game control with a winning and losing screen, uh, design, build, test, and complete a fully functional game project. And we will do that multiple times in this course. While we're learning these topics, we're still going to be going through and, and making some really cool games. Um, but as I'm going through these tutorials, not only do I go back to the notes and come back to making the game, but while we're, we're writing our code and making the game, I, I'm sure that I, I really explain myself and explain what's going on. I'll go into the libraries and, and show where I found different methods and how you can um, not only do the things that I'm instructing you to do, but also show you how to access other, other areas of the code to do other things. 
And then here is an example of the Asteroids game with a score counter, health bar, um, able to fire projectiles and destroy. If you destroy all the Asteroids, you win the game. All right, well, here we go. I hope you're excited to take the course. To install Greenfoot, we simply need to go to greenfoot.org and click on the software, and you can easily download the installer for any one of these operating systems. I'm on Windows operating system, so I'm going to go ahead and download the installer. Now, once the installer has been downloaded, you need to go through the default settings, very quick and easy. Once Greenfoot is installed on your computer, you should have either a tutorial or a new scenario pop up. If not, go ahead and go up to scenario new Java scenario and let's go ahead and call this first scenario just go ahead and get started in Greenfoot so once you open up that new scenario you're gonna have a what we call a world uh, and this world is where your environment and your actors are going to live where the objects that you wanna your players that you're moving around the screen or any simulation that you make, all of the actors that do anything are gonna be entered into this world, okay? We need to add our image in for our world. So we have world class, where our environment, our background is, and our actor class. That is where our objects and our players are gonna be, and our enemies and our different projectiles and different things. Right click on my world, which is specific to this exact background that we're using and you are going to create a new background I like the space background image you're welcome to choose what you'd like you have your execution controls down here speed reset run act these are different options you will have when executing your program or game the first programming topic we need to talk about is what a class is so a class is a blueprint for creating objects the class holds attributes and behaviors that we want our objects to have and do. And so I was talking about height and hair color for a person, maybe their name. Um, all these things could be attributes that you could attribute to an object. Um, but if you notice here in the example, we have class dog and we'll make just one class for the dog. And we will describe different options, let's say, um, that the dog can have for their state or attributes uh, like their breed age color it's not the same with every single dog so we need to we need to give the opportunity to have different attributes uh, for each one of these dogs as well as behaviors um, dogs bark sleep eat uh, certain dogs might have um, attributes that cause them to be maybe they run faster um, and different things that you might need to incorporate into their behavior uh, based off of their attributes. Um, so it defines a set, a class defines a set of properties and methods that are common to all objects of one type. Here we have our class dog and within the class of dogs we can have multiple different dogs. These dogs can be different breeds, ages, colors, sizes, but they all have some of the similar behaviors. They all can bark, sleep, eat. In the yellow box up there, I've programmed out what it would look like to create class dog with the different fields. Um, and I've created a new Chihuahua and a new Husky. Um, so two different instances of the class dog. So we have the Chihuahua and the Husky. So now we'll talk about how we can incorporate a class and how it looks in Greenfoot, as well as uh, how we will use them in Greenfoot. So here in the background, you can see we have three different asteroids. Um, these would all be different objects of the class asteroid in the world. So our class name here is asteroid, but we have maybe asteroid object one, asteroid object two, and asteroid object three. And we can describe their attributes and the way they behave um, within the class. And so that's what we're about to create and our objects inherit that information from our classes world and you notice our world class and our actor class are highlighted now those are our super classes and they've been created by greenfoot so that we can take some of the information that is stored in this world class and actor class and we're able to use it within our game so our world class has 
a lot of information that we will get into and you will be able to see, but that has attributes and behaviors for the world. And then our actor class holds information that our actor subclasses can use. So our asteroid, enemy robots, projectile, ship player. Listen and we'll, we'll go through in Greenfoot how we are going to create our classes and from that add the objects, instances of the class into the world. Now that we've set the image of the world, just simply click reset and your image will pop up. Now we're gonna create an actor for our My World. So you right click on actor and you create a new subclass. Now this actor needs to be named something. And so for this new class, and we're gonna name it ship player because we are gonna use the rocket image and I've picked that before so it automatically pops up, but it's under transport and rocket right there. Now we're gonna add our ship player, one instance, one object of the ship player class into the world. So we're gonna click into my world so you can double click or right click and open editor. And we are going to, now we're gonna add our object of the class ship player. We're gonna add our object that is of the class ship player. It's important to leave comments in your code so people know what you're doing with your code and it's very good practice. You're rarely gonna be programming completely by yourself in the real world, so it's important to leave comments so other people can help understand what you're doing with your code. So to add an object in, we need to first define what it is we're doing. So we have a, we're gonna tell the computer it's class ship player, and we're gonna create a variable name for this ship player that is normally called ship player, lowercase by default, but we are gonna name it something else to help um, you guys remember that it is in fact a variable. And this is defining that, yes, it's of the class ship player, what we're getting, but we're getting one object of ship player. So this new ship player is when you have one object and this is de defining the class that it is and it's of the ship player class. So don't get confused that these are named the same thing. This is an object of the class ship player, one instance of the class ship player. And then we're saying, we're gonna call it, name it our main player. So this is our name for it. Okay, um, you're gonna add object main player, which is we have set equal to a new object of the ship player type. And then we need its X and Y value. So we want half of X value and half of the Y value because that gets us the center of the world. Okay, and I'll show you how that works. So this gets us the center of the world because if we have the X value and Y value in Greenfoot and in a lot of programming and, and game development things, um, it's zero, zero right here. X value zero, Y value zero. So anything down is getting larger and anything to the right is getting larger for the X value. The Y value is getting larger going down X value gets larger going across. We have set it at 300, so half of the width and half of the height, 200. We actually wanna make our world size a little bit bigger. So let's go ahead and go back in. And what's been created is a new world with 600 by 400 cells with cell size of one pixel. So that's what each of these mean. We'll leave it at one pixel for now because it gets hard to work with. Um, so we're gonna increase the size, so this, the cell size is gonna stay the same, um, but the X value and the Y value are gonna change. So let's make the X value 1,000 and the Y value 800, and on my screen that barely fills it. Should not really scroll at all, barely fills it. But the problem is, is this rocket, our ship player, is now at, well, 300, 200. And he needs to be in the middle. Instead of doing that math over and over again, if you change the size of your world, it is good programming habit to remove numbers wherever possible and add in um, variables that can change. So you can access, there is a, a method 
one of the methods that's saved in the world class is accessing the width of the world. So all you have to do is put get width and open close parentheses. We'll talk about that more. You'll see that um, here and there um, divided by two. And then we want to do the same thing with the y value, not but not get width. We want to get height divided by two. Okay. Now, no matter what the size of our world is, the rocket will always show up in the middle. Okay. Um, now that we have added in this ship player class, as well as one object or instance of the ship player into the center of the world. Let's go look at how to write a method so that we can manipulate these objects. Let's pretend we're programming a basketball game or simulation. So we would create a player class where we can store attributes and behaviors of the different players within this game or simulation. And we have attributes that we can assign these players, like their height, speed, jumping ability, shooting ability, offensive ability. Also, how you want them to behave. So how fast do they run? When to jump? when to shoot, when to pass. And this is the stuff in GreenFoot we're gonna see in the act method um, where we are telling the object to do something. And then within those player classes, we can have specific objects. And these objects can have different names. So LeBron James would be one particular object instance of the player class. So LeBron James would be an instance and he would have certain attributes and behaviors and abilities then Stephen Curry would have different attributes as well as different abilities um, and they might need certain attributes to be able to do certain abilities. A little more on objects. Uh, yes, they're an instance of a class, just one, and they have states and behaviors that are set. Um, and they, the classes are the ones that store the states that an object might have. So um, an object like the dog could be of different breeds um, or different sizes and the class stores the different options that the objects have to be. Objects may have different parameters which are the states, attributes, characteristics that we're talking about and I put those in parentheses on purpose because we will see parentheses all over our programming and code and we want to make sure that we understand that those are sometimes called arguments um, or parameters and they're things that need to be plugged in to the code in order for it to work. So if an object was expected to have a breed or be a color, um, you would have to plug that into the parameter or into the object in order for it to, to work or the program to run. Um, just imagine if a dog wasn't of any breed or wasn't any color or didn't have any size, all of those attributes didn't exist, then it wouldn't be a dog. The only way it can be a dog is if it is a certain breed of dog. Um, it has to have a size, it has to have a color. But all of the same options for behaviors and functions uh, are for each dog. So a bark, a run, a jump, a smell, all are things that the dog class can do. Um, and they can all be accessed from the class. Here's an example of what creating an object looks like programming wise. Um, we will use the keyword new to create an object. Uh, so car is, remember the class type, my car is the name of this particular car that I'm about to create. Um, so that is the variable name and then it equals new car and, and the car must expect a type of car or a make of the car and a model of the car. Uh, the gas mileage, excuse me, the miles per gallon it gets, and then the overall mileage of the car. So we have car, my car. Uh, so my car is a Toyota Camry, 32.2 miles per gallon at 100,000 miles. My sister's car is a Ford Focus uh, with 28.5 miles per gallon and 80,000 miles on it. And my mom's car is a Nissan Murano, 27.5 miles per gallon with 120,000 miles on it. Notice that each of these cars have their, are of the same class, but all have certain states, attributes, and characteristics given to each. Most all of the behaviors, functions of these cars are the same, but the physical states and characteristics of each instance of the car class are different. So all of these cars would be able to drive, brake, 
turn. And so you can understand how all of their behaviors might be the same, but a lot of the attributes of each of these cars are different. So now we're about to create our first method. Um, a method in object-oriented programming is a procedure associated with a class. A method defines the behavior of the objects that are created from the class. So as we were just talking about our car class and how we would be able to turn, drive, brake, and all those things, um, those are examples of different methods uh, or sometimes called functions that we will put in our class. And so another way to say um, is that a method is an action that an object is able to perform. So a method has three main parts that have to be involved in creating the method. Uh, you'll see a return type, which many of our early return types will be void because we will just be doing actions and telling uh, the class to do something instead of expecting uh, to receive information back. And then you notice in the parentheses, the parameter is the value passed to the method. And oftentimes early on, we will have the, this parameter be empty um, because it's a little bit more simple to start off by just having empty um, parameters and void return types, just telling instruction our instructions to our class to do something. Um, here's an example uh, of a method. And so within our class that has make model miles per gallon and mileage, our class is set up up top. Um, in red, you see public void act, um, and this is going to be common in every one of the actor subclasses that we create. The only thing that will default show up in that class is our class setup, our basic default class setup, as well as the public void act. And this um, is the main method in Greenfoot. And when we run, when we push the run button, uh, that is what will happen. Uh, our different methods that we need to create, but these are the names of the methods. So we have a drive method, a break, a turn, a honk method. And we make sure that you're adding semicolons uh, when you're ending statements. Uh, this is a basic rule and it just declares that the expression of the statement is over. And so you don't wanna use a, a semicolon when you are creating our classes, our methods, if statements, loops. Um, here is different blocks of code and this is what we call blocks of code. So uh, these curly brackets will block off to start and end our code. Uh, sometimes they are on the same line as the class name. So you have class name, open close parentheses, and then a curly bracket to start up there. In an if condition, we won't have the semicolon to after the end of the if and then the parentheses for the condition. Also, uh, the method name, we will not have a semicolon there. And then our four down on the bottom right is our for loop, and that will um, not have a semicolon. Here we have two different methods. One of the methods is our act method here, and the other is our move around method. Now our act method, even says in the comments, will do whatever the car wants to do. So whatever we instruct the car to do. Once the act or run button gets pressed in the environment, this method will be called. Within this act method, you are calling a, another method. So our act method always gets called when, a but, when the act or run button is pushed. And within that, we're calling the move around method. So this is a method within a method. Our move around method is described partially down here. It has two if statements shown. The first if statement says that the move key must be pressed and the key up must be pushed. So when those two keys are pressed, your rotation will be up and you will move one. If the move key is pressed and the right key is down, your rotation will change to zero and turn right and your move will be one. Within the act method, we're gonna be adding more and more methods within it. And each one of these methods needs to be named very particularly for what they do so that not only you can organize your code correctly and you can make changes when there are errors or different things that you need to change within your coding, but also other people that w might wanna come in and look at your coding, it is important that your methods are named correctly. And also oftentimes you will be using methods that you create more than one time. So if you create this move around and you have other classes that can inherit this move around method, then you would be able to save time from having to copy and paste or recreate this code um, and you can just call this method. Now we're gonna create our first method. 
So just double click on ship player and your editor will pop up. So whenever the act method or the run method gets pressed, this act method will happen over and over. And then it says add your action code here. So this is what you could tell the ship player to do. So it explains what the class is. It's the ship player class. That's where we're at and it extends actor, meaning it has access to all of the pre-made code that Greenfoot has made um, for the, their actor class. So in order to search some of these different commands that you're able to do in different methods, you gotta click and go to documentation and here is a list of methods that are inherited. Some really cool ones out there, some just change the location, set the rotation, turn, turn towards something, if it's touching, is that edge? Many, many of these methods we are gonna be using um, to create some of our games, okay? We can also create our own method. And in order to create our own method, we need to have the same setup as we did, as they already have for the act method. And we have our public void, and I wanna move around method, okay? And you, if it, since it's a method, you have to add an open close parentheses at the end of it, and we will go over that in further detail a little bit later when we talk about parameters. So this is your parameter, and it's an empty parameter right now. Okay, and you want to block off your code with an open curly bracket. You hold shift down and click on the bracket, and a closed curly bracket. Okay. Our act method already had its open curly bracket and closed curly bracket. And Greenfoot's also color coded a lot of these things. So you notice this yellow box indicates where the act method is, and this yellow box indicates where the move around method is. Act method is what we would call our main method in other programming. Let's just for testing purposes do a very simple command. Um, and oftentimes it helps to test in programming, know where, where you're at and, uh, and figure out if you're having any issues. So if you push control space, you'll see a lot of different methods that show up. And these methods um, all have different capabilities and you can kind of read some of the descriptions. Some things, sometimes there are things that are required in order uh, for the method to be able to fully complete. Um, such as if you're checking for objects in range, you would need to know a radius and what object you're talking about. That's what it has here, requirements. Getting the rotation doesn't have any requirements because it is just finding the rotation of the object as well as many of these. So um, the one we're gonna do is just this move. So it's move, open parentheses, int, close parentheses. Now this int stands for integer, meaning that inside of this parameter, which is this parenthesis and this parenthesis, um, a integer number is required because it's gonna, that's gonna be the distance or the speed at which you travel. So um, the move command requires an integer that is representing the distance that you're traveling. Okay, so if you just click on this, it'll actually pop up, move, start of parameter, and then the end of parameter, and even highlights what that it, you need to put something in there, an integer. So we're just gonna put in one and see what happens. Okay, and so if you click the act, and you look very closely at that ship, it's slowly moving along there. Now, if you push run, it will. it's like holding down the act method and it runs 60 times per second while the speed is right there in the center. Okay, so if I push run, it'll run 60 times per second, meaning it will go one pixel, since it's move one, it'll go the distance of one pixel 60 times per second, so 60 pixels per second, okay? Now we're gonna create a new method that is not part of the act method. I'm gonna erase the move one. That was just for testing the act method. And now we will learn about these, what we call keywords later. You notice public and void are highlighted. That's because they're special words that we use. And we're gonna do a call our method, name our method, the move around method. And we're gonna have an open close parentheses. 
and then you need to block off your code with an open curly bracket, and I always do enter, enter, close curly bracket. Um, you know, different people program a little bit differently. Uh, I think it's easier for teaching to have this on a separate line, but oftentimes you will see um, that top bracket on the same line as your method, okay? But for me, I'm gonna put it down here. So we want the move around method to have the capability of the user saying how far or what direction uh, the object is moving. So we are gonna have to do something we're gonna talk about here in a second, but I'm gonna give you an example first of an if statement. So if, and we can access a different library of Greenfoot code that has been imported in, and you can do Greenfoot dot, which means it's accessing the Greenfoot class. Okay, there's a Greenfoot class that has been imported in. And if you do control space here, it'll show you all the Greenfoot commands that are in there. Get random number, um, play sound, set world. These are all Greenfoot methods. Um, we are going to be using if Greenfoot dot is key down. And what key? Well, we're going to start with the right arrow key, so the right key. Add a second parenthesis because there's one right here, as well as right here. So you need two close ones. Now we will not have a semicolon on this line because this is not the end of our line. If we had this, we could have this in one really long line and be really hard to read, but this is really still part of this if statement, so we're continuing on with it. So there's no semicolon. So if the right key is down, we want the rotation of the object pointed to the right. So if I do control space, let's look and see if we have anything in there for the rotation. All right, we have get rotation. That just finds the rotation of the object. Return the current rotation. Oh, see set rotation. Hmm. All right, let's look at set rotation. Set rotation requires an integer. Set the rotation of this actor. Rotation ex is expressed as a degree value 0 to 359. Okay, so if I wanted to point to the right, that is the way it is currently pointing. So that rotation would be 0. So to the right is 0. Remember that. Um, and that is always the starting rotation of the actor. So if you have, find an image that's pointed to the left or up or down, well, its rotation will be zero at what, whatever direction it's starting at. You can see over here the ship is starting to the right. And all the objects that are saved in Greenfoot uh, do start to the right. If Greenfoot dot is key down left, we can do set rotation again. I do 180 instead of zero. And then we can actually just copy, not reinvent the wheel here. Up and down. And the rotation for up would be if zero is to the right, left would be 180, 90 more than 180 is 270. And then down is 90. And then also, while they are turned, you want to move four. So we can move a little bit of a ways. Okay, move four. Don't reinvent the wheel. Let's copy, paste, paste, and paste. Okay. Now, our ship player still will not move because when the run button is pushed, only the things in the act method, okay, only the things in the act method are done. And so nothing is done in the act method right now, but you can actually do a method call, which puts this move around inside of this act method. Now you might think that's silly. Why don't we just do all these if statements inside the act method? But we are going to have a lot of code in our programs and it makes it easier to find errors um, and know where the problem lies if you have split up the methods. There's also um, a way to inherit methods from other classes. So it can save you time so you don't have to redo and remake the same method over and over, as well as many other reasons. So let's test and see if we can move around. 
Okay, so now you have a ship. You've created a class ship player. You have one object called main player and you can move around. Now if I add in other objects, they will move in the same way that our first object was because they are all of the type ship player. If I hold shift and add all those objects in, um, but when I reset, they are not saved into the world unless you hard code them into the world. Now we're going to talk about if statements for a moment. An if statement consists of a Boolean, a true or false expression followed by one or more statements. So over here on the right, we have our flow diagram. Uh, we have a condition and if the condition is true, we will do the code that is in the condition. If the condition is false, we will just skip all, skip the code. Um, and we just created our if a key is down, we will turn and move. Uh, that would that was our if statement that we just created. Another example of an if statement is here, and this is not the Greenfoot IDE. We are still uh, creating a class that we're just calling a test class, and we're going to create public static void main, which just means it's our main method. That's our act method in Greenfoot. We've set a value x to 10, and if x is less than 20, we print out that this is an if statement. So this is just a good example of what an if statement would be. So at x is 10, 10 is less than 20. Um, so it does print out that this is an if statement. Now that you've learned some of the basic Java programming concepts, we're gonna go ahead and create our first game. Now this is gonna be a new world that we're gonna create. So a new class, a new subclass of world. So we're gonna right click new subclass of our maze world. So that's going to be our first game is going to be our maze game. And you will go to backgrounds and you will choose the let's try this sand background. And then you do new maze world uh, would create a new object maze world. And that's what your background looks like. Okay, and so we're going to need to create a new subclass of actor that's going to be our walls in our world and our maze world so the subclass of actor and we can just call it um maze block and we are going to choose uh, a background image because uh, it's nice and block and square um, and it's it's easy to manipulate and it, it is 50 by 50 so it's very easy to utilize um, as you're creating your maze. So in order for our maze world to have walls that can line up easily, um, we're gonna change the pixel size. So right now, every little tiny pixel that you move, um, you could put this maze block anywhere in here, okay? And it can look like this. But when we create our maze world, and we have our cell size. So we have 600 by 400 with cell size one by one. So this one is the size of the cell, the both the width and the height of the cell, one by one. So if I change this to 20, I would have to divide each of these numbers by 20 in order for it to um, be the same size, okay? So 30 times 20 is your 600, that's what you'd get, and 20 times 20 is the 400 that you'd get. So if I compile here, I have the same cell size, but these maze blocks, you can kind of see they line up a little bit more square. Now we are gonna make ours so that they line up perfectly, and knowing that they're 50 by 50, um, you would need to choose to do 50 here. And let's go ahead and do about a 12, by 12 maze. So this allows you to have a fairly big maze and you can line these up perfectly right here. Um, and so my suggestion now is to quickly create a maze. Um, it does not need to be super complex. We will be creating enemies and different things in there. So the, the ability to get through the maze is not the main objective here uh, to make it difficult to get through the maze or confusing. Um, you're welcome to make it however you want, but I'm going to go ahead and create my maze right now.
So now that I've created my maze, I need to make sure that it is saved properly. So if I right click and save the world, Greenfoot has made it nice and easy where all of my different maze blocks are. So you can see the location right here at 0, 11, and these certain different spots. Now the issue we have is when I put my maze runner in the game, I don't want them to be moving that fast, that quickly from one cell to another. So I actually want the cell size to go back to one by one. And so we are going to do this back to one and this to 600 and 600. Okay. Now the problem is, is that now these think that this is on the 11th pixel to the right, which is not what we want. We want the 11 times 50, so it would be in a way different spot. So all these will be in the upper left corner, and we need to edit them so that they're not anymore, and they do what we want them to do. And there they are in the upper left corner. So what we need to do is go back to our maze world, and we're going to have to now there's a better programming way to do this in the future, but right now we are, uh, just want to try to create a simple maze and I want to get you guys going in the maze instead of trying to teach you a difficult concept right now. So I'm going to quickly speed through this timesing by 50 to each number. Okay, so as I go through this, there are quite a few, but I'll go fast. So now the objects are shifted just a little bit up and to the left. So we're going to need to add in some walls here to make sure we finish this maze up. So I'm going to add in one here and here. Okay, now we have our maze completed um, and we need to create a player um, from our actor class. We're going to do a new subclass. We're going to call this guy Maze Runner. The animal I'm choosing is the mouse. We need to put our Maze Runner into the world. Um, and if we put our Maze Runner in there, it's a little bit bigger than we would like. Okay, so um, how we're going to do this is we're going to get the image of the mouse that we already have and shrink that image down immediately as it's added to the world. So the way you do that is we're going to create something called a constructor method. Create our constructor method. Adding in comments will help you learn on your own and remember things, the reason we're doing things. Uh, it'll help with other people being able to read your code and readability. It's very important. Maze runner. And so the constructor must be the name of the class. So this is a special method. It's called the constructor method. Okay? It has to be the name of the class. Okay? And so this allows you to edit things in the maze runner. They have an empty maze runner method. You can always create a constructor method, um, but by default it's empty with nothing in it. But we're going to change that. So we're going to access the image maze runner. Okay, get the image. So now that we have our constructor set up, we need to change the size of the image. So we're gonna get image. So if we look in our documentation, there's a lot of different things, but right here, there's a get image option. So we can access the image that we currently have. And then within that, there are different methods that you can do within an image. Okay, so within this image, we can mirror it horizontally or vertically if we're trying to do um, a little bit of animating, turning a character left or right in a little a Mario platformer game or something. You might want to mirror horizontally. Um, but what we're going to do is scale. And uh, what we can do with scale is we can access the image's current width. So we're going to access the image one more time to get the width. Okay, and then we're going to take the width so we're going to scale the x we're going to scale this image down to the what the current width is divided by two which will cut it in half and then take the same thing get image 
So we're going to access the image so that we can scale the image. And then we're going to access the image again to get the width of the image for the x value and divide that by 2 and get the height and divide that by 2. So that allows us to access our image. And why we don't want to put this in our act method, this will happen 60 times per second when you push run. And so the act method will happen over and over again. The constructor method will happen once just before the, when the world is getting constructed. So before the act method is pushed, the, you'll notice that when you scale, so now that we've done, gotten done scaling um, and it's in our constructor method, uh, if you go check and you add in a maze runner, it's going to be half the height and half the width. So it's going to be nice and small and perfect for us to get through the maze. Okay. The reason that works is that in our constructor method, before the act method is, is run, just when we're building our world, the maze runner, uh, we've created a, a constructor method will be half the height and half the width. If we put it in our act method, it would cut the height and width in half 60 times per second. So over and over and over and over and over again. So we definitely don't want that to happen. Okay, so now that we have our maze runner, let's put them in and let's save the world. And now uh, we need to put in our code for our maze runner. Now, our code for our ship player is going to be quite similar to the code for our maze runner. What I would like to do is create a super class that is our movers. Um, and we're going to have different methods for them. So we're going to put the move around method in there so that the maze runner could get that method whenever they want. Um, so it'll show the opportunity that we have with super classes to make them very useful. So we're going to create a subclass of actor. It's the first thing we're going to do. And we're going to call it uh, movers. Okay. And they're not going to have a picture. This is just going to be our super class. Now I want my maze runner to instead of extends actor. So it's not going to be a subclass of actor. It's going to be a subclass of movers, which is also a subclass of actors. I also want my ship player, since it's, a, it's also a mover, to be in the movers class. And then we're going to take this move around method and we are going to cut it out. And we're just going to have a move around method in the ship player. And then when we go into our movers class, go into movers class, we can create this method. And now, the ship player can access the move around method that is in our movers once we compile there. So now ship player can access move around and maze runner. All I have to do since it extends movers and movers has the move around method, maze runner, just put move around, open close parentheses. And now, even though we're in, our, we're in a different world, our maze runner can move. Okay. Um, some of the issues though that we see with this is that the maze, the mouse will flip upside down um, and we don't want that. And it'll go up. I just want my mouse to face forward and just move. So I'm going to actually change the name of the move around to move and turn. I think that is a better name for it. Um, and it'll make it so that our ship player can still have the move and turn. And our maze runner is not going to have the move around or move and turn. We're going to add in a method, new method that'll be a different way to turn. So public void slide around. Okay, so you're going to slide around. Um, open curly bracket, close curly bracket. I have public means it's going to be accessible to other classes. Void means this method is not going to return anything to you. It's just going to command. There's just output. There's no return back to you. Okay. Um, so we're going to do similar if statements. So we're going to copy and paste, not reinvent the wheel here, but we're going to change this set rotation and move. 
to, I'm going to use control space to find what I want here. Um, this is getting information. We're trying to set the location and slide and not turn. So this set location is what we're going to use. And that um, technically is a teleport um, from one spot to another. But we're going to teleport so short distance and so fast that, um, that we'll be able to use it to slide around. Okay, so get X. <clears throat> If I'm going right, I'm going away from the zero, zero, so plus four. Let's make an X and a Y value for our movers here. So an X equals get X, and Y equals get Y. That way, we can just use X and Y, and X plus four will move us to the right four pixels and the right key is down and I'm just gonna copy and paste this in and just change the numbers around. So I'm gonna get X minus four. <clears throat> going up, I'm going towards the zero of the Y, so I'm gonna go minus four here. Um, oops. I go minus four here and then that would leave just plus four right here okay so this is the slide around method so I'm gonna need to put this in the maze runner the ability to slide around okay so I need a semicolon 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 okay now we can test our maze runner Yes, they sl slides as we would like um, and moves around. Okay, perfect. So now we are going to create, we're going to talk about return types um, and show how we can use return types to stop us from running into walls and return whether you're hitting the wall is true or false, um, as well as other things. Now that we have our maze runner the correct size and moving the correct way, we're gonna have our maze runner um, not be able to walk through walls. So we're gonna actually go into our movers class and we need to be able to check in our movers class um, on another object if it's hitting our maze walls. So we are gonna create a new method with a Boolean return type instead of a void return type and we're going to call this hit walls open curly bracket enter enter close curly bracket if we are touching the wall so how can we ask if the mover is touching the wall well if we do control space um, there is an is touching with a class and that is is touching what do we what have we called our walls we just call them walls, maze block, maze block dot class. We need one more parenthesis. We will return true because you will, this method will return, will be true if you are touching the maze block. So you are hitting the wall. So what it needs now is a way for it to be false. And so any other time, if it's not touching the maze block, it should be false. So we're going to use another keyword that you can use. And this is a else, an if else statement. So if this is true, return true. If it else, we are just going to return false. So our hit walls method needs to be implemented in our slide around method. So we are going to copy that method call what we call that's a method call so we are going to whoops so we're going to copy hit walls and we're going to put it in as a method call on set location so if you have the right key down you're going to be moving four to the right 
Um, but if our hit walls is true, if hit walls We are going to set location minus four instead of plus four. So just like Newton's law, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when we are pushing to the right and we run into a wall, the wall needs to push to the left just as much against us so it balances it out. Okay. So you're going to use this in each one of your right, left, up, and down, but you just want to make sure it's the opposite. So we're going to change the Y here on up and down to plus 4, and the Y here to minus 4 to the Y. Four. Now, if you have any trouble after this, you need to test your code and make sure it works. Okay, hit walls, maze block. So, we go in. We don't have to change anything to maze runner. Maze runner is getting the slide around method, which the slide around method is accessing the hit walls boolean return type method. So it's returning true or false, and now we can easily manipulate our right, left, up, and down. Okay, these methods make it much easier to read your code and understand what's going on. So now we know if we hit the walls, we're going to get pushed. Okay, so we run the code, and then you can see that you get pushed off the walls, and now we have a working maze okay, that you can run through. Okay, now we're going to talk about variables. Um, Within our code, we have all these numbers here that we're using, uh, and it's nice if we try to change a lot of these hard numbers in here uh, into variables so that we can manipulate them at any time, uh, and it, it makes for a little bit better readability and people understanding what this these numbers represent if they are actually variables. So we are just going to start off with a basic uh, speed variable. So we're going to do this outside of all of these methods because these methods run over and over, and this is setting um, our variable equal to 4. And if we're going to manipulate it in here, we can't have at the beginning of each one of these methods it get reset to 4 over and over and over again. So if you have it outside of the method, speed is just 4 once to start. So just right at the beginning, speed will be 4. And so we could replace it all in here, but we're not using the move and turn method. We're using the slide around. We can change this to speed. And don't reinvent the wheel. Copy, paste. Oh, make sure your commas don't get erased. Didn't even mean to make that rhyme. All right, make sure you get it every time. All right, so now we have a variable that is called speed. And notice that none of this, met this method has no numbers in it. Okay, speed is stored as four, and so it won't change at all for us. Um, but now we can manipulate speed and kind of do what we want with it. And that's what we want in our code is that, is that ability to manipulate whatever we want. And so um, if you want to, Format your code and make sure everything's lined up correctly. A great thing to do is Control Shift I, Command Shift I, and that will auto format. Um, so if I have, you know, these all over the place and spaces where I shouldn't, Command Shift I will relocate all that back to where it's supposed to be. So that's a good way to clean up your code. Okay. Um, so now that we have a variable, let's try to manipulate this variable. So we're going to need to create another subclass, and it's just going to be an object. It's just going to move on its own. So it's not going to be one of the movers that we have. So we're just going to create um, speed boost. 
and we know that mice love cheese, so might as well make it a cheese pizza for us. Okay, our speed boost is right here. Um, let's go into our maze runner and actually copy this code and put it in our cheese pizza speed boost. Create one more public. What? How do we make a constructor? What is this going to be called? It's going to be called the class name speed boost. And we want to reset the size of this before the act method gets run. It's just going to happen one time. So we want it in our constructor. And then when we compile this, speed boost is a little more reasonable of a size. Okay, so go ahead and I'm going to put a few speed boosts in here. And then I'm going to save the world. So now our speed boost objects are in there, but we need to have our maze runner react. Something happen when we collect the speed boost. Okay, so in our movers class, we have our speed as four. Um, we need to manipulate that. So we're going to create public void collect boost. Okay. And so now that we have our speed variable, we need to manipulate the speed variable um, with a method for when we collect the boost. Um, it will increase our speed. So if we are touching the speed boost, we need to increase our speed and then remove the speed boost from the world. Okay, so our is touching, um, once again, will come into play. So if we are touching the speed boost dot class, open curly bracket, enter, enter, close curly bracket, we are going to have our speed equal speed plus one. But actually, this happens so often because that's the way you add one more to, to a variable uh, that they have a shortcut speed plus plus. Okay, and then after we add to that variable, we would like to remove what we are touching. So let's see what we have here in our methods that we can grab. Um, we have a remove touching here. Okay, remove one object of the given class. So we are going to remove speed boost and end with a semicolon. And now our collect boost method is stored in our movers. Okay, but we need to use that in our maze runner. We need to make sure we go in and use the collect boost method. And then we need to check, make sure this works. We're gonna run, okay. And then are we faster? Okay. And now you can test in a few different ways. You can just drop a couple of speed boosts right here and see how fast you can get them to go. Okay, you can also inspect. Um, speed is now seven, so it started at four and now it's seven. See how fast you can go and it's hard to control once it goes too fast. Okay, because it'll jump. All right, and so um, another thing we can do that we're gonna need to do is have a max speed speed boost. So pretty simple here, we can make, um, in the act method, we can just have a simple if statement um, that is max, max speed, essentially. So we can create our own method if we'd like, um, might as well, public void 
max speed. And we're going to set our speed variable. So if, and we're going to use um, a math expression here. So speed is greater than seven. Actually, we're going to do greater than or equal to. So greater than first, then or equal to. So if speed is greater than or equal to seven, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, we're going to do set speed equal to seven. Okay, so that means the max it'll be is seven. So if it's greater than or equal to seven, it'll just stay at seven. Okay, um, compile. Let's make sure this works. If I add a whole bunch of speed boosts right here, should be stuck at seven. Okay, six, let's add one more. Seven, let's add one more. Max speed needs to be placed in a method in your maze runner. Okay, and actually max speed might be more specific to our maze runner, um, but we can just call it in right here. Okay, so now, the max speed our maze runner can get is seven. I'm going to try dividing our size by three so I can get a little bit more room to go through the maze. Notice I've been bouncing off the walls a little more than I have in the past. so. Give you an opportunity to get a little bit more flexibility moving around the maze a little bit better. Yeah, I like that better. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, scale it down to a third of the size so you can move around a little bit better. Um, you don't have to do that, but I feel like that's a good thing to do. Um, now let's move in some enemies. And now these enemies are going to move on their own. Um, so we're going to create enemies class and we're going to have our enemy flyer and we are going to set the image of the enemy flyer to something that can fly might intimidate a mouse. Okay, we have our pelicans. Okay, now we're gonna use that same code to make these pelicans a little smaller. Okay, so we're gonna copy. Um, let's go ahead and go into our enemy flyer. Public enemy flyer. Command. V, let's change these to two. Okay. Now these pelicans will be nice and small. Then we can get going with the enemy flyers and their movement. Okay, so I'm gonna have just a very simple then move forward. So there's just the move method. That's all we really need right here. Um, and we'll just have them move five. So we'll be moving pretty fast. Okay, and then within that, we will have our wrap at edge code. And so um, we're gonna create a method in our enemies. Cause I could see us using this in multiple levels. Um, to create our wrap at edge, public void, because we are going to want to wrap our enemies um, at, to the edge of the world. And so wrap at edge 
we're going to be using if statements to check if the object is at the edge of the world. Okay, so the edges of our world are get world dot get x or get width get world dot get height because we can access our get world code and we can do control space and see what it gives us. This is still our actor code dot. Okay, now we have dot. Now we'll notice that that's different here. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we can get width and get height. We've done that before. So we're going to get world dot get width. And if our x value, int x equals get x, and int y equals get y, and we can do if x is greater than the width of the world, minus 1, because remember we start at 0. Um, we also should create a variable int uh, world width equals get width minus one, get world get width minus one. Okay, creating this into a variable will make it much easier um, to work with. So we're going to set our location to, if, our, if we're greater than the width of the world, we want to go back to the beginning of the world. So that would be zero on the x value. And our y would be just y. Leave our y the same. Okay, now we're going to do a combination of that, but, but moving some, some things around. Um, on each side of the world. So if x is greater than world width, well, what if x is less than or equal to zero? Okay, so if x hits zero, what, what, where do we want it to go? Well, we want it to go to world width, and we actually need a minus one more from world width because, and we need to set world width greater than or equal to. And we need to do world width minus one more so that it gets to the size of our world minus two so it doesn't bounce back and forth between going back to zero and then going back to the world width. So we actually need to change this to a one as well so that when it relocates from the right side and tries to go to the left side, it doesn't hit the zero part of the world and then bounce back to the right side because that way it would go back and forth and it would get stuck. So make sure you have one pixel of wiggle room so that you relocate not to the zero because then it'll flip back to the right side, but relocate to the one when we wrap it edge. Okay, let's try and do this again. So why, and we need to do our in height, world height, equals get world dot get height minus one and we want our world height so if y is greater than world height greater than or equal to excuse me um, we want the x value to stay x but we want the y value to go to that one just like we did here. And then x is, excuse me, y is less than or equal to zero. We need our x to say the same. Our y will equal world height minus one. Okay, and now we put rapid edge in our enemy flyer. Um, get height, open close parenthesis. All right, so now we test. 
So if our enemy flyer is in here, we run it. Woo, they're flying. All right, it wraps. It wraps at the edge. Okay, and so that's how we create our enemy flyer and have it wrap at edge. And so now we want to make it a little bit more difficult to get across our screen. Okay, and so we are going to create an enemy flyer object. Now it's saying that we have an error. Um, I have added in an object and then I deleted it and then I saved the world. And so when you go into the maze world code, um, the enemy flyer was created and then we added it to the world. But then we removed this object. And so that, that memory of the object getting removed is saved into our code. Now, unfortunately, when we deleted it, and then we added two more in, it read this one as getting deleted, and then it added two more in. So either I need to get rid of the remove object and the one that's also named enemy flyer, so when I created this one and then I deleted it, the next one I created was also named enemy flyer. I can do two things here. I can name enemy flyer, enemy flyer two, but we already have that. So I can name it enemy flyer three. Remember, we can name this whatever we really want. As long as it, when we add the object into the, into the world, it is also enemy flyer three. So this will add this object into the world. Okay, um, but, we can simply remove the remove enemy flyer and we could just have enemy flyer one and enemy flyer two really whatever you name it like i said is fine um, as long as it knows that it's getting named okay so then once we compile and go back to our code now there's no error that, that's showing and we still have these two enemy flyers now we want to go back to our code and if we want it just for the, this maze runner, we could put it in maze runner, um, but we could also put it in movers, okay? And so we need to create a new method, so I'm scrolling all the way down to the bottom in my movers, and I'm gonna create a public boolean hit enemy. Okay, now the reason I'm using a boolean instead of public void um, is because I want all of my enemies in all of my code to be able to access this hit enemy boolean and know if it's true or false. Okay, and so um, if similar to is touching the speed boost, so I need to realize what do I actually want to do? Well. I want to know if my mover, whatever mover I have, is hitting um, any of my enemies. Okay, so we already did if touching. Okay, so we can do that again. If is touching, which is an actor method. So if I do control space, I could see that is touching is right here. And it asks for the class. Okay, well, I could do my maze runner if it's hitting the enemy flyer class, but I want this method to have the ability to know all of the enemies. So that's why I'm going to do enemy.class. Okay, I need to add an extra parenthesis there. And then every time I create a new if statement, I do enter, open curly bracket, enter, enter, close curly bracket. That keeps my indentation almost perfect. If you want to make fix your indents and you notice your color schemes off or you have the error reached end of file while parsing, that means you have a curly bracket that is not closed off. Error found in class. Okay. Uh, if you click on the red right here, it'll tell you what your error is. And that error is reached end of file while parsing. That tells me my curly brackets are off. Now, I want to move this over automatically. Let's say it was way over here and all, all of it was all messed up. You can always do edit 
auto layout. Okay, or, and that'll fix it up right there, or Command Shift I. We'll do that same thing. So the keystrokes are Command or Control Shift I, depending if you're on a Mac or a PC. So if you're touching enemy dot class, and it's giving me an error, because actually my class name is enemies, which I, I guess since I have more than one enemy, um, eventually we're going to create more than one enemy, so enemies is okay um, as a class, but you really want to try to, uh, if you're having more than one instance of the enemy flyer, the singular enemy flyer, you would want to make it singular, because if I, just because I have two pelicans on there, those are two separate objects, they're not two different classes, so here I have multiple enemies telling, and mo multiple movers, because eventually I will have multiple, um, enemies classes and movers classes so if we're touching any of the enemies class we're in the movers uh, we want to return true okay the reason we another reason why you want to use a boolean return type here's the return type um, is that we have the ability now to access if hit enemy is true or false and then within our specific mover, we can say what we want to do now that hit enemy is true or false. So what if we wanted to do something different um, in different in different classes? So like our maze runner, if our maze runner hits an enemy, we might want it to relocate to this exact spot. But our ship player, which is in a different world, we might want it, if it hits an enemy, we might want it to do something completely different. And so you want to have that flexibility in your code. And, and that kind of goes on and on. The more in-depth coding and the more game development you have and programming in general, having the flexibility to, to use if it's true or false and have use that in different ways and have that react in different ways is, is very helpful and very good. Okay, um, so we need to have another. So if I just left it like this, there would be an error. Okay, and the error would say missing a return type. Um, basically, a Boolean has to either return true and have another way of returning false. So basically, else, otherwise, if we're not touching an, any of the enemy's class, we want hit enemy to return false. Okay, and now we're going to use this Boolean specifically for our maze runner right now. Later on, we'll use it for a completely different um, purpose and we won't relocate it back to the same spot um, but now we want to relocate this so we're going to access inside of our method we need to create a specific method an action method that does something so when when we don't have a return type a return type generally means it's a question is it true or false uh, what is the number that we're trying to get if, if we're using uh, an int return type or a double. Um, I'm going to call it maze runner hit. Okay, so we specifically know that the maze runner is getting, when the maze runner gets hit right here, um, and so we're going to say if the hit enemy just general hit enemy, which we have. General hit enemy, which we have in our movers super class. So our movers has the hit enemy. And our maze runner is going to access that method that we have created. Just like our other, our ship player can access the actor code when we do control space, or maze runner can access the actor methods if we, and functions when we do control space, we can do the same thing by our own created methods. Okay, so our maze runner, if hit enemy, open close parentheses, equals equals true. Okay, we will set our location of the maze runner to 40. 560 
and that will return us back to our original spot, which our original spot in May, our maze runner was 40, about 40, 560. Okay, and what's nice is that this is specific to the maze runner. This is not specific to the maze runner, but it's accessible by the maze runner because the maze runner extends movers where our hit enemy is, or hit enemy boolean method is. Okay, now there's a better way, an easier way to, um, to do this. We can just get rid of equals equals true. That is, that would work, and that will work. But the faster and easier way to declare this is simply hit enemy. That just is saying that that boolean must be true. Okay, and if you do not want to hit the enemy, you just add an exclamation point, and we'll go over that more a little bit later. Okay, and so that would be if it's false, you'd add an exclamation point. Okay, so let's check and see if that works. We need to first call this maze runner hit into our act method for our maze runner. And now we can go in. And if we get hit, we go back to the beginning. Now you have a little bit of something that you need to dodge in your maze. You can go in and it adds a slight bit of difficulty to your game. And we're going to continue to add some difficulty to the maze game as we go. Now we're going to create a new enemy. Um, we already have our enemy flyer that flies across the screen and wraps that edge. Um, this is going to be an enemy walker, and they are going to be bouncing in our maze. And so they'll react to the walls and um, create a different aspect of your game. And that's very important to know. Um, simple games are are good and and our games will be simple um, but you want the game to be a little bit more dynamic than just having one type of thing and to be honest uh, it would be better practice to not copy and paste this but um, because of time constraints and, and we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later we are going to just do the old brute force, just copy and paste. Now, it would be much better practice to have a method that scales down our enemy flyers um, and we could pick the amount that we want to scale it down, but that's a couple steps that would take a little bit longer um, as of right now. But normally you want to do things the hard way at first because it'll pay off in the long run. Um, and so, now with our enemy walker, I need to create a constructor class. So I'm going to paste. So I'm going to copy what I have here. So I'm going to paste the enemy flyer code that I copied. And I'm going to change it to enemy walker. Okay. Now, that was pretty simple, quick, and easy. So you can see why I wanted to do that then. Okay. And now our... Enemy walker is going to move in a new and different way. So our enemy flyer moves in one way, very simple, very straightforward, and has rapid edge. So we can access rapid edge um, in our enemy's code if we need it for our walker. Okay, um, But we should create a different way for the walker to move. So um, I want this specific to the enemy walker. I don't want this method accessible to other classes. Um, so I could just call it private void move around and that will make it so that it's only accessible to this class. Now the reason uh, most of the time we do public is because as I'm going through this there's going to be times when I'm going to be accessing different methods from different classes but this move around method for specifically my enemy walker is just going to be for my walker. So now that we've set up our method we need to really think about how we're creating this method and what we want this method to do. So we want an enemy walker to be able to be in here and bounce back and forth along the walls. Okay, um, we also want, want it to bounce down a class. We can first do set up our X and Y like we've done before. Get X, Y equals get Y. So within this method, it'll always start off by 
accessing the X and Y, we want to say that we're going to be moving by our X and our Y value. Okay, but we don't know. We would need to have a, a separate variable that tells us if we want to move up and down or left and right. Okay, and so this method is going to require something that's telling us the direction that we want to go. Okay, and so um, there's multiple ways you can do this, but we are going to create a parameter that will be given to us that will tell us whether we're up and down or left and right. So we're going to put a variable inside of our constructor, which is right here. Remember you see public and the name of the class, the enemy walker class. It is the constructor, and that's where we put our physical traits and characteristics of our specific objects that we want to use. So we have one object that has something specific in the parameter and another object have something entirely different in their parameter. But we need to define, define what we want. Okay. So we're going to create a Boolean that says up and down. So this will tell you if it's true, we're going to go up and down. If it's false, we're going to go left and right. So now that we've created that parameter, we need to set that equal to something that is available within the class. So it gets given up and down. But enemy walker class needs a way to receive that information. And so if we do boolean up, if we create a boolean up down, we can have up down and set it equal to up and down. Now that we have our variable up down and it's equal to the field that is coming in, this parameter field that's coming in that is up and down, and we're setting up down equal to up and down. We can say if up down is true. Oh my indentation got off. Control shift I. Make sure that your color scheme is right. Okay, good. My class is covered. Okay, um, your Y value is going to add um, speed, but we need to create a variable for speed. So int speed equals two. It's a small amount right now. Okay. Um, else if up down is not true, so I use the exclamation point, I want to set my location to x plus speed comma y. Now we want to put our move around method in here. And as you can see, our enemy walker that we've added in already is having a problem. It says constructor enemy walker in class enemy walker cannot be applied to the given types. It requires a boolean. What it has found is no arguments or an empty parameter. So the actual and the formal argument lists differ in length. So what it's saying is it needs the boolean that we just said. Well, is up down true or false? So we need to decide, is this going to be an object that we move up and down? Well, let's look in our code. If you remember, this was right on the corner, so it really could be true or false. Okay. Now we compile, no syntax errors, and we should be able to be good to go. So now our enemy will add to the speed, add to the Y value, and so it should move down, and it does. Okay, so let's add one more in, and you'll see something interesting when we try to add another one in. It adds a parameter that we need. I want this to be false. So now this guy is right on top of the other one. Now this one will move to the right, and this one will move down. So you can see now how we can specify our objects of the same class.
have in our movers hit walls. So this method could actually So I've already created a hit walls method, so I shouldn't reinvent the wheel. So I should just be able to do if, but I won't be able to, and you'll see why. If hit walls, oh, let's get this lined up right. So here is my field, an empty parameter, and then I need to close the parentheses after it. Open, close, now there's an error, okay? And the error pops up because we don't have access to the hit walls. If you remember, our hit walls is in our movers class. Our enemy walker is all the way over here. Okay, so I'm gonna create a separate class that is movers, and the movers will be both the enemies and the players that are moving. So I'm gonna create a new players class that'll go under movers, and it'll be it'll be a subclass of movers, a super class of maze runner, a super class of ship class, ship player. So it's gonna go right in between these two in the hierarchy. And then I'm gonna move enemies along with me. Okay, so maze runner is gonna have maze runner. Instead of extending movers, I'm gonna have it extend players. Okay, still an error there. We're not there yet. Ship player. And look, maze runner has moved under players. Players can access movers, movers can access actors. So you see the hierarchy going here. Now, ship player gonna do the same thing. Still, we'll be able to access all the code, move and turn, which is in our movers, can access all the code from movers because it's still a subclass of it. Now, I want my enemies to also extend players. And so all the players, not players, So I want my enemies to be able to be a subclass of all the movers because an enemy can move and so can the players, but they're on two different sides. The players we're gonna control and move around on our own and the enemies move, move around all by themselves or, and the enemies move all by themselves. Okay, so we go into enemies and we're gonna change extends actor to extend movers. And now, if we compile and go back in here, we have our mover superclass that's all up here. And we have enemies, we have two enemies in there, and we have our players, and we have the maze runner player in this world and our ship player in another world. Okay? So now we want to go back and we are trying to have our enemy walker be able to hit walls. And now they can because. Our enemy walker goes into enemies, and then the superclass of that is movers. And what do you know inside of movers is that hit walls method. Okay, so instead of having to copy and paste and move it around and figure out where I'm going, now I'm going to say if hit walls, shoot, we already have a way to hit walls, but we might do something a little different than our maze runner. So if our maze runner hits a wall, it's going to relocate. We don't want, oh, it hits an enemy. But if our maze runner hits a wall, and if we have slide around method, if our maze runner hits wall, this happens. But we're gonna use a different method for our enemy walker. If the enemy walker hits wall, we're gonna do our own thing. So um, let's create our own method, always a good idea. And this we might use for other enemies. Um, so we might as well make it public. We can change it later. And we want to make sure that this method is lowercase so you know the difference between a constructor class that you're throwing in there or a class that you're referring to would be capitalized and a method and variables are lowercase. So you always want to keep with that practice. So enemy hit walls. So now that we have our enemy hit wall set up, control shift I, 
Okay. Enemy hit walls. So now I'm going to use this code that I started here. I'm going to move it down to hit enemy walls. So if enemy hits hit if the enemy hits the wall, what do we want to have happen? Well, we want the speed to so the speed moves it up and down. Well, right now it just moves it down because it's plusing the speed. Okay, and if it does not, if it's not up and down, it's just moving to the right. But we want if it hits the wall, it to move the opposite direction. So speed equals negative speed when you hit a wall. Okay, so if I add in an enemy walker that is moving to the right, so if I have it be false, up, up down be false, this enemy walker will move to the right. This one will move down, but it won't hit a wall, so we won't be able to test that one, so we need to test this one. Okay, so if it hits a wall, we need to put it in our act method. Okay, so hit enemy walls needs to make sure you put it in the act method. We're going to add in one more walker here false so it can go right and left so this one will go right and hit a wall this one will move down and won't hit a wall so we wouldn't be able to test that so boom it hits wall it bounces off excellent that's exactly what we want okay now we want to go in our walker and say if we hit the edge okay and let's check and see if we have um, a, a command a, a method for that Okay, well, if our actor um, is at edge, okay, so we can use that, and we can, we can use that, and so what do we want to have happen if they're at the edge? Well, I want to see them bounce off the same way they bounce if they're in the maze, okay? So we can do is at edge, a method already stored, and we're going to learn what we call play logical operator. And there's more than just one of these. So you want it to, if it hits the wall or it hits the edge of the world. And we already know there's the is at edge method. So if you do shift and between the enter and the backspace or delete and enter on a Mac, there is, if you hold shift down, there is the backslash. Um, but if you hold shift down, it creates these lines. And that, those pipes we call them, um, is the or. So if it hits the walls, or is at edge, is true, we will bounce. So now, we have our enemy walker. We might throw in another enemy walker false that bounces left and right. Um, we can put this somewhere in the code. So we can see it bounce off a wall and left and right, and we run it. And now it bounces at the bottom, it bounces at the left, goes up and down, hits the wall, so it interacts exactly how we want it to. And now our game's a little bit more dynamic, um, and we can figure out some of the best spots to put these in. So when I'm running through here, okay, is this possible? We need, it, we need to know the difficulty level in our game, and it looks like it's near impossible. So also realize that, oh, there it is. That's how you do it. So you want to see what, what we can do here now. Okay, so now you can get through the game a little bit more easily. Maybe we throw in another one of these, make it a little more difficult at the end. So you can always change the name of your classes by just going into the editor and, and just changing the name in the code. And then that will, Greenfoot will automatically change, change the name here. So I'm actually going to change it one more time to UN screen. So there's no confusion on what's going on. Um, and then I'm going to say, and these aren't movers, so they can have their own class for now. And if I need to make a super class later, because uh, I'm seeing the same thing getting used, then I'll do that. But uh, I'm going to create the UN platform. And, and we can have a, create a door. And that can be our UN out. Set image, my maze world. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to delete where it gets relocated back to 
back to a location that is a little bit lower than I wanted originally. Okay, so we're going to go back in and not set, change the location. Okay, that's closer to where I want it to be. Okay, so sometimes you got to fudge, fudge numbers around inside the code. You can't just delete this and add in another object and keep deleting and adding. So um, if the maze runner hits a UN platform, actually if any player hits a UN platform, we want the UN screen to pop up. So our players... Um, we can do public because we want to be able to access this later. You win method. So if we win, I'm going to lowercase y here. So set up our method. Enter, enter. Some space, control, shift, i. Um, if any player is touching a U win platform. Dot class. Okay, does that work? Yep. No errors. So if you're touching the U win platform dot class, we want to add an object. So what we need to do, get world, because inside of our world code, that's where add object method is available. Just like how in our actor class, there's move and turn and set location, our world class has add object. So we need to go add object. So we need to access the world class. So we'll go back into players. We're gonna do get world. So we're gonna Use the get world method, which accesses the, the world class. And a dot is kind of the travel, a, a signal for traveling, referencing uh, somewhere else. So we're going to reference the world class, and we're going to steal their add object method that they have. And the add object method will um, create a new object of whatever class you put in here. So we want the U when screen oh no we don't want to add a whole class in there we want to add one add object so we've actually already done this before so in our maze world it does it for us we add object and the name of the object so what is what is this enemy walker 3 literally what object is it well it's a new enemy walker now in this case it's got a specific parameter but when we add object U win platform, we are just creating a new U win platform, but we're naming it lowercase U win platform. Okay, so we can create, since we know we're just going to create one standard U win screen object that doesn't move or doesn't have anything specific in the parameter, we don't need to name this variable. Now, sometimes people would do what they did in the maze world when, they, when you get a little bit more complex into programming and that for, further along in this course we might use create a a method here or excuse me create a variable here that represents un platform open close parentheses so the new un platform object but right now we're just gonna say new un screen and the location needs to be the center of the world. So we're going to get world again dot get width because this is the x value and divide the width by two. Get world dot get height divided by two. Now if you start seeing yourself in whatever game you're creating reusing this, you need to figure out a way to create this as a variable. Same as anything else. If you're using something over and over again, you need to figure out a way to create it as a method, create it as a variable, um, just any way that you're not reusing the same thing and redoing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so now our U win needs to be available for whatever player 
that is currently in the world. Well, the player that's currently in the world that we want to use it with is our maze runner. So our maze runner can access the players class, which is where our you win method is. And so our maze runner can win now. Okay. So I could go through it and challenge myself again. You're welcome to do it, but I want to save time and cheat my way to the end. You win. Hold on, there's an issue. If you notice, all my objects are slowing down, but they're still moving. That's not how a game stops. That's not how you, you beat a game. And on top of that, notice what's happening. Let's, let's check it out. So oh, why is it slowing down? That's weird. And watch what I do here. If I move this up, and out of the way, you know what's underneath here? You can see it. Another you win. And another you win. And another you win. And another you win. And another you win. So there's a couple ways you can do it. We need to go into the you win. We need to change something in that code. So you go into players, or you in, if you're touching the platform. And now you there's, there's a couple different things you can do. You could say, you could create a variable, and have it, if we wanted to create a number, an int, you could have it be zero, or you could create a Boolean variable, and have it be uh, game going. And if game going is true, and you're touching the platform, you could add an object you win and then change game going to false because game's not going anymore. And then that would make it only happen one time. But Greenfoot actually has a method that they've created that we can use. And so it's, it's not in your world, not specific to your world or specific to an actor. It's specific to Greenfoot, similar to like pushing a key down and having input. This is specific to all of Greenfoot. So it's in the Greenfoot class. So Greenfoot dot stop so greenfoot.stop open close parentheses is a method that will stop greenfoot at that time now we check if you hit the un platform un pops up and look my run button is still available to be now it's available again so let's look at this again so i push run and i go and i hit the un screen all my objects stop I have one UN pop up, but if I push run again, a new UN will pop up, but it stops it again. So it literally just stops it from running. Okay, now the last thing we need to do is we need to add a way to lose the game because I don't want unlimited tries. You have a certain amount of lives. So now we want to create a parameter for our maze runner so he only has a certain number of lives. So our maze runner needs to have a parameter uh, in its constructor that is number of lives. Okay, so we can have int maze runner lives. Okay, so we've made it available for this class to have a variable maze runner lives, but it doesn't know what we want it to set it to. Well, we want to set it to whatever, similar to what we just did, actually, exactly like what we just did. We want it to be equal to whatever gets plugged in the parameter for lives. Then we can manipulate lives like we did before. Okay, so we can do public void lose life. Okay. And now all we need to do is if hit enemy. lives which is what we've plugged in but wait it doesn't recognize lives ah because the only thing that it recognizes are variables that have been created within this class so we actually need to do maze runner lives which is equal which that is equal to what we've plugged in so essentially it's the same thing but the computer doesn't know what lives is as is so we need to Change this to maze runner 
lives. And we are going to do minus minus. Minus minus subtracts Maze Runner lives from its previous down one. Okay, and then our other Maze Runner hit program method allows it to relocate. Now, let's say I wanted to have a specialty where I have unlimited lives or I wanted a different way to gain back lives. Um, it's still important that we created this parameter and we created this variable, but we really probably could have just put maze runner lives in here. But you know, it's not much difference in amount of time, and this gets it broken down a little bit more. Okay. So now we have an issue with our maze runner because we don't know how many lives we want to give it. Well, in this game, let's give it three lives. We have not called that into the act method yet. So now we need to call lose life into the act method. Now we need to copy and paste lose life into the act method. Copy, paste. Okay. Then now when we go in here, go back into my code. Then I go back into my game. And one, two, three lives down. Then I check. Inspect. So before, when I created my own method of lose life, you know, I thought I was breaking down the problem a little bit more um, and, and making it work a little bit better. But if you realize our hit enemy, excuse me, our maze runner hit is happens prior to the lose life. So we're resetting the location and then it's checking again later on if hit enemy is true. But when it's relocated, hit enemy is false. So it never was getting rid of my Maze Runner lives. So there's a couple solutions I could could cut and paste it in here, but I still want it separate. So if I make lose life higher up in my act method and make it above runner Maze Runner hit, then when I run it and I hit an enemy, two, three. And I inspect and check what my lot maze runner lives are. Now it's zero. Okay, so now we can use that. So we can create a public void you lose method. If whoops, control shift I. Okay. If um, our maze runner lives equals equals zero we are going to do the same get world dot add object new you lose so we're going to create a class you lose and we are going to add it in similar to how we did with the un so get world get width divided by two Get world dot get height divided by two. Now I've already written this code twice now in my in the same game, um, and I have a feeling I'm going to continue writing it. So in in a future lesson, I'm going to show you how you can create this um, in a way that we can we can manipulate this and, and do this automatically because this has taken a little too much time um, for my liking. So then I'll do greenfoot dot stop again um, because if you lose you want the, the game to stop. So the new you lose needs to be created. So there's going to be an error there because the you lose has not been created. So just like the you win platform, instead we don't need a platform for the you lose. We just need a you lose, and I need to capitalize this. I didn't capitalize it before, so I need to go back into Maze Runner. And I need to capitalize the Y and U, and you lose. And then again, we're going to create a new, we're going to set this image. Do need to make sure that the you lose is in the act method, as always. Something that can be easily forgotten in Greenfoot. You need to make sure you put it in your main act method so that it actually, this is where the action happens, so it actually have it runs. So now... If I hit one, two, 
three, game over, game stops, and we have created our first full game in Greenfoot, and this is our maze game. Hope you enjoyed it. So now that we've finished our maze game, I'm going to quickly review some of the topics we covered. Um, some I'll talk about more than others. Uh, others, I'm just going to mention them now, and we will uh, go further into detail about them in later games. But uh, we learned about what a class is. So we had our example of our two different types of dogs, a Chihuahua and a Siberian Husky. The class of dog describes all of the dogs. And so you can have different types, breeds, age, color. That's the states and attributes and their behavior, bark, sleep, eat, are methods um, for those dogs. Uh, when you're writing a class, we have our car class that we have to make the model, miles per gallon, mileage, and then the behaviors of the car, drive, brake, turn, and honk. Um, learning how to block our code and, and knowing when to use a semicolon on each of these statements actually should have semicolons at the end of them. Um, whereas when we're creating our classes and our methods and our if statements and our loops, they should not have semicolons. Um, what an object is, it's just one instance of the class. We haven't changed those yet, um, but they're all acting pretty much the same. The only one we did change was we passed a parameter in for the snake, and we said uh, up and down is true, and they would go up and down. Uh, if it was false, it would go left to right. So that was the, uh, the information, the Boolean that we passed through, the true-false uh, that we passed through to the snake. Yeah, and that's what we used with, for objects. Okay, and then writing an object, you have to use the keyword, which is all of those words that change colors uh, and are mean something specific in Greenfoot and in Java. Um, you're going to use the new to create a car with the make model, miles per gallon and mileage. Um, we showed a little bit about public versus private. We're going to talk a little bit more about those, but those are access modifiers, and they say what is available to other classes. So um, obviously public makes other the visibility outside of the class uh, is the most visible you can get it and private is the least visible that you can get it. Um, what a method is, how there are return type, method name, value passed to the method. So this would be the true false boolean that we pass to the snake. Uh, this is the return type. So uh, if we're hitting the wall in our maze, uh, that was the boolean return type and nothing is passed to it. Um, but it, the method would check if our main player was hitting a wall and if it was we would return true it is hitting a wall else it would be false okay so that's what's getting returned mostly we did void return types which was a command an instruction uh, is what a method looks like our act method runs 60 times per second we have other methods within it getting called uh, semicolon ends a statement when to and not to use the semicolon you saw a little bit of inheritance, subclasses and superclasses in our maze game, but we're going to go much further into it. Um, just basically the fact that the superclass uh, can store any data and then the subclasses can inherit or access that those methods um, from the superclasses and fields. So we have our superclasses of animal, um, a mammal is a type of animal and a type of mammal is a dog. So uh, these subclasses can access information from methods and fields. Um, the Greenfoot API. So what does application programming interface mean? Uh, it's a collection of pre-written packages, classes, and interfaces with their respective methods, fields, and constructors. So we have a screenshot of the Greenfoot API um, and some of the methods that are in the actor class. They have the ability to act, get access an image, get objects, do a lot of different things. Uh, what a variable is, we talked a little bit about that. Um, variables are used to store information to be referenced and manipulated in a computer program. They also provide a way of labeling data with a descriptive name so our program can be understood more clearly by the reader and ourselves. So what I mentioned in the maze and, and what I want to reiterate is that it's very important to name uh, our variables correctly. When you get further along in programming, the the value of understanding what your variable is um, is very important because you could have a, a lot of different variables coming from a lot of different places. So it's it's very important to to know that. Um, it's helpful to think of variables as a place that a a value is stored um, rather than the actual information. 
So um, the location or the, the place that the, the value is stored, it's a reference um, to the variable. Okay, um, the sole purpose is to label and store data in memory. Uh, variable declaration, how to declare a variable's name and its value. Okay, so we, we did a little bit of this, but there are um, four data types, essentially, that we're going to talk about. A string is not exactly a data type, but I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, we have string, which is shown and looks as text. Int, uh, which is integer numbers. Uh, double which are decimal numbers, and booleans, uh, which is true-false. Congratulations, everybody. You've just completed chapter one. Um, if you've gotten this far, you've, you've done a lot of great things, and, and hopefully you're taking notes along with this, and um, you're, you're listening to all the instructions and the PowerPoint slides uh, and utilizing that information so that you're, you're, gonna, you're going to be able to create your own games at some point. So you learned a lot of different uh, programming topics this, this chapter. Uh, classes, objects, methods, if statements, variables, int, double, boolean, string, uh, inheritance, both sub and super classes and how those interact. Uh, we were able to look and get into the Greenfoot API library and really grab whatever methods we wanted uh, from the different uh, classes Greenfoot's made for us. We did uh, create some constructor classes. I haven't gone over those through notes, and which, which we will later on, um, as well as passing parameters, operators, arithmetic, assignment, relational, and logical operators. We'll talk about those as we go through, but this is just plus if you're trying to add two different things together, minus, multiplication division modulus is a remainder and we'll talk about that next chapter this is up incrementally so up by one and this is down by one um, assignment operators which assigns one a variable value to another value um, and so and then the plus equals will add and set it equal to and the minus equals will minus the value on the right and set set it equal to that um, and so on and so forth here and then the relational operators comparing one value to another um, if it equals to it if it's greater than or equal to if this value is greater than or equal to that value um, and then less than equal to and not equal to is the exclamation point equal sign and then there's the logical operators the two ampersands is checking if this is true and this is true this is the or operator uh, and this is used with what we call pipes and you just hold shift and then between enter and backspace you can make those pipes and the exclamation point uh, is the not equal to or the not operator and then uh, so if, if something is not true and then these gaming concepts we talked quite a bit about and we, we gave examples of so we created multiple lives uh, added enemies in had player control and then the enemies could wrap at edge, bounce off the walls. We had a you win, you lose screen, uh, as well as a speed up variable and, and doing a lot of different things. So I, I hope you guys have enjoyed it so far and uh, maybe take a little bit of a break and then get back into chapter two. Now that we've completed our maze world, we're gonna make it so that we can have the ship touch an object in our my world. So we right click, and select new my world and now we're back in our my world class now we need to have an object in our my world that allows you to transport to the maze world and you start your maze game we're going to create little mini games along here so that we can uh, access our different worlds so I'm going to create a new subclass of actor um, that is called maze game um, and so I'm going to go into our maze world and take a screenshot of the look of my maze and that in our maze world will be the new picture that we will use for the maze game okay so we need to import from library So now we have our maze game, our maze game image. Um, I want this quite a bit smaller. 
So I can go into my maze game, public maze game. And now that I've done this this many times, I'm going to, so we're about to create a super class for all objects within our code. And so um, as you can see here in this diagram, the animal is the super class of all the other types. And so mammal extends animal, reptile extends animal, dog extends mammal, and alligator would extend reptile. And so understanding that the syntax, this is the syntax that we will be using, you, we, you will see how it's going to be easy for an R code, all objects will be able to be inherited by all the subclasses beneath it. Create a new subclass called all objects and create a method that gives us the opportunity to manipulate that. Um, so I'm going to need to have my maze game extends all objects. So our all objects class needs to have a method public void shrink size. And this is going to need to have a parameter uh, that has two different values for how much we want to scale down. So instead of shrink size, I'm going to say, call it scale down image. Okay, and we're going to need an int x value and an int y value of the, that image. Okay, and so these are different things, um, variables that are coming from outside of this method that we need to have put in in order for us to, to know what we want. And so um, we need to create horizontal scale down and vertical scale down. Okay, and these are gonna be variables within the all objects class um, that will be set equal to whatever gets plugged in for our X value and our Y value. And then we're going to scale this image down. And, and based off of the X value and the Y value get that gets plugged in. So um, scale down image will be similar to our code that we've used before to scale down other images. So we're gonna not reinvent the wheel here. And our enemy flyer had a scale down. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste this here. And I'm going to have divided by horizontal scale down, divided by vertical scale down. That way our users uh, or we in our programming can change how much we want to scale these down when we have the scale down image plugged in. Very, uh, the scale down image method right here plugged in with the integer values that we want. So our maze game player will use this scale down image by three and three. Those are our variables. So it's going to get a third. They will be divided by three and divided by three. And now when we plug in our maze game, it is quite a bit smaller for us. And that can be used in any object at any time. So if our movers instead, so we open editor and extends all objects. Now they have the capability, all the movers, to access the all objects class. So enemy flyer, instead of having this, could have scale down image uh, two and two for this object. And now when our enemy flyer gets plugged in, they're scaled down. Okay, so when we see them in our 
May's world, they are also still scaled down. Okay, and so it's very cool that we're able to change up this method so that now, like we said earlier, we don't want to have to do that over and over and over again. We're going to create this all objects where we can put pretty much whatever method we want and have it uh, able to be accessed by all the objects. It's kind of like our own actor class that they've made, but we've had our own, you know, minor changes to it to make sure that it uh, it works. And we're specific to scaling down an image. So now we have a method that we can scale down any image at any time just by doing scale down image and we can do the amount that we want to scale it down by X and by Y with these parameters that we've created. So um, a very valuable method to learn. So back in our My World class, we are going to add in a maze game object. And we are going to go ahead and save that to the world. So now we have our maze game. And I moved it just a little bit and I saved the world. And so it is going to try to relocate the maze game image on me. I'm just going to go ahead and clean that up right there. Uh, it's created its own prepare method for the maze game. Uh, didn't have to do that, but we will be using the save the world uh, command when appropriate. So, so now we need to be able to move our ship player. And when it touches the maze world, it teleports into the maze world. So uh, this is going to be specific to our ship player. So we're going to create this method inside of the ship player code. We're going to say public void enter maze game. Now, normally we would be wanting to create comments, um, but that would slow down this tutorial video, and I want to jam pack as much stuff in there as I can. And I am explaining it in my voice as I go. So if we are touching, is touching, and we do control space, is touching. We, if we go to the is touching, it will tell us exactly what we need in here. So we need a class. We need to know the class that we are touching is the parameter. So we need to know is touching um, our maze game dot class. And then if that is true, we want to set our world. So if we do control space, do we have anything in here that allows us to set the world that we are in? No. Okay, so in our my world or our maze world, we got access the documentation. And since we're trying to go to a different world from my world, there is a there is not a way to set the world from your world code either. So what you're trying to really do here is we're gonna go there's a greenfoot method that is created in, in Greenfoot that is able to be used to set the world. So we are going to set world, and we need the name of the world. We're going to do a new maze world. That will be our, ob our object. Even though it's a world class, it is one instance or one object of the maze world. So if we go back into ship player, we can do greenfoot, access the greenfoot class here. And once we access the Greenfoot class, you can do control space and search through the Greenfoot class. And you can set the world to a new maze world. because We're entering the world. So now we need to enter maze game. It needs to be a method call in our act method. because It won't happen unless it's in the act method. So make sure you enter it into the act method. And then we play. And we play our, and then we're right into our maze game. Now. So if we play our maze game and we succeed, we now want when we hit instead of the U win screen and the stop, we're going to go into our U win screen. And once that U win screen object gets created, I want to have a counter uh, that equals zero, starts at zero, and then right when it gets built, I want it to increase. So I'm going to have count plus plus and then if count is greater than 200 remember this happens 60 times per second so it'll be about three seconds a little bit more then I'm gonna set the world back 
greenfoot dot set world to a new my world screen a new instance of my world when we go in and we enter our maze we can go in and if we win the game I'm gonna cheat my way to win one two three so the reason that didn't work was that our count is getting reset every time we create a new you win screen object there is a new term that I want you guys to understand and that is static so class variables also known as static variables um, are declared using the static keyword um, and they are declared outside of the method constructor or a block but inside of the class and we've already created um, many what we call instance variables but these are class variables an instance variable is related specifically to the one instance of the class that you're referring to as opposed to a class variable or static variable is is in reference to the entire class so no matter how many objects are in the class or when they get added or or where they are within the code um, the class variable stays the same it is one constant so if we had 10 enemies all with two health it doesn't matter which if it's a static variable class variable it doesn't matter which enemy you hit all of their health would go down if it was static int health as opposed to just int health with no static um, that would be an instance variable or what it looks like here so this is outside of the constructor outside of any methods and it is declared here and this is an instance variable so each instance of flappy bird would have its own count its own gravity its own jump pressed and passed pipes so here in our space invaders game you can see that once one of these objects hits the edge the entire class will move down and as you can see in the code we have static boolean at the edge static int direction static int time on wall if I moved them all the way over I would hit the edge of the wall all the time okay so it doesn't matter it doesn't mean that this one will hit the wall and then bounce off the wall it means all of them have the same value at all times of either on wall or off of the wall so prior to me putting in static this integer was new every time there was a new instance or new object of you win and we have been adding you win adding objects new you win every time you're touching the platform so even when my maze game was not finished even when I hit the platform, the you win would add over and over and over and over again, um, adding in new objects and resetting the count. But once I put in static for the you win screen, uh, this now is just created for the class and it stays with the class, not with each new instance, does not reset the count. So the the static makes it so that this is one variable allocated to the you win screen and it's always always there and always constant as the variable for the you win screen there is not a new one every time a new instance is created so our count starts at zero and the second that the you win screen is available a, one instance of the UN screen count stays steady throughout count does not reset to zero every time there's a new instance it it keeps going uh, with the class so now we have a way of accessing the maze world and then bouncing back and we're gonna need to create a new game now foot dot stop where you would um, have to replay Greenfoot and you would just it would keep running and stopping because the game would be over. I want it to just pause the game um, without stopping the, the simulation from happening. So right now when you push run, the simulation happens. So in our maze runner, we have the public void you lose method right here. And we are going to change greenfoot.stop 
So something else. So I'm going to do control space stop. There's a delay right here that we can use. Okay, and this delay, we want it to delay for how long and pause how long and how long. So um, what that's going to do is that if I put in a number like 150, it will pause for two and a half seconds. 120 would be two seconds. It paused for 150, 60 frames per second. It would pause for two and a half seconds. Um, so then we would say within that if statement, we want another if statement that allows you to push a button and that button will take you back to the previous world. So we're gonna do greenfoot.is key down a one and the, once again, we're gonna use the greenfoot method that is in here that is set world and the world we're going to go back to is my world okay um, now if we run it one two three and then this will delay but then they'll move it'll delay and then they'll move and now if it doesn't pause the simulate it just delays the game if I paused it myself, I could look and see that each time after one and a half seconds, it does create a new you lose, but they just stack on top of each other and adding in a few images doesn't really hurt you at all. What it does do is that it leaves it running. And so when we then want to push a button to go back to the previous world, I just push one. And the next time it goes through that 150 frames, it will take you back to the previous world. So before we get started on our Flappy Bird game, I just wanted to reiterate some of the basic Java operators. The arithmetic operators, plus, minus, division, multiplication, modulus, uh, plus, plus would be incrementing, and minus, minus would be decrementing. The modulus will divide whatever's on the left from whatever's on the right and find the remainder of it. So 5 modulus 4 would, 4 goes into 5, one time with a remainder of one. So that answer would be one. If something five modulus five, that would be a remainder of zero. We do this a lot when we wanna time something out. If something's constantly counting up, we're gonna count it. If we wanted something to happen once a second, we would have if the variable that changes, maybe it's count modulus 60 equals equals zero. That would mean every time count divided by 60 had zero remainder, we would do that if statement. Okay, and then we have the relational operators. Double equal sign would be comparing whatever's on the left to whatever's on the right and seeing if those were equal to each other. And this would be not equal to. This would compare left to right less than, as greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Then we have the logical operators. So if this on the left and this on the right is true, we would do the if statement. This is the or operators. You hold shift down and do the backslash between the backspace and the enter. And then the exclamation point is the not. Um, so this would signify if something is false, we would not do it. Or we would do it if this is false, if whatever is in this is in front of is false. Then we have the assignment operators equal sign, don't get that confused with the double equal sign. This will assign, like if we want our variable to equal five, we will use one equal sign. So I, I like to associate this with the variables that we create. We always use the assignment operators, making it equal to something. This plus equal sign will add. So if I did speed plus equals two, it would add two to the speed and set speed equal to two more than it was previously. And the minus equal sign does the same thing, subtracts if speed minus equals two, it would subtract two from the speed and set it equal to two less than it was previously. And the same thing goes for these as well. So the arithmetic operators are used in mathematical expressions in the same way that they are used in algebra. The following table lists the arithmetic operators. Assume integer variable A holds 10 and variable B holds 20, then these would happen. A plus B is 30, A minus B is negative 10, and so on and so forth, and you're welcome to pause and read through those. The relational operators, we have A 
holding 10 and B holding 20 once again. So A is not equal to B, so that is this statement is not true. A not equal to B is true because they're different. A greater than B is not true. A less than B is true. A greater than or equal to B is not true. A less than or equal to B is true. And you can read the descriptions if you'd like. These are the logical operators. So um, this is just comparing A and B. Um, so if both are non-zeros, um, this is just checking if A holds true and variable B holds false. So if both the operators are non-zero, then the condition becomes true. So A and B is false, that is not true. A is true, B is false in our example. Is A or B true? Um, yes, A is true, so that A or B is true. And this is a tricky one, so this is if a and B is not so exclamation point reverses the logical state of the operand if a condition is true then logical not operator will make it false so a and B is false like we set up here um, but we put the not operator in front of it so that is then true now the assignment operator so C equals a plus B will assign a plus B to C C plus equals A is equivalent to C equals the old C plus A, and so on and so forth. Now we are going to create a Flappy Birds game. So I'm going to create a new subclass. I'm going to call it Flappy World. So this will be a new world class. So I have my sky blue, and I will create a new Flappy World. Now I want to make my world a little bit larger than it is, so we will open up our world class. And here where it's created our world class, we have one at 800 by 600. Okay, now our world's a little bit larger. Um, we're going to create an actor. And our actor is going to be one of our players. So, um, I'm going to create a new subclass of players. It's going to be Flappy Bird. Okay, and then I will insert my image for my Flappy Bird. And now I will insert my Flappy Bird. Now, first thing you notice is Flappy is a little bit too large there, so we're going to need to have a way of manipulating this specific object of Flappy Bird. The class, the size of the object will be the same, but for this specific instance, um, we want Flappy to be smaller. And so we are going to create a constructor method, um, which is sp specific to when... A Flappy Bird gets added into the world and there's no fields, no set fields for it. Um, it'll create this just Flappy Bird. So with that, we are able to change the aspects of that specific object and resize the world. So we are going to set image um, and we're going to set image. Actually, we are going to do our method that we created. Aha! This is why you create your superclasses. Um, in our all objects, we created a scale down image. And so Flappy Bird, I can just put scale down image. I'm gonna make Flappy scale down to a tenth of the width and a tenth of the height. If you guys remember, we've already created this scale down image in our all objects class the X and Y value that they were plugged in by me, the 10 and the 10, and it does the width divided by horizontal scale down, which we have said horizontal scale down is equal to X, and vertical scale down is equal to Y. So now when we put flappy in, it's the right size. Okay, we want also to have a ground, and so this will just be a general object. Um, of the actor class, and we'll call it ground. Ground won't do much of anything. Um, so 
So once you lay the ground down, I have three grounds here. You line them up evenly. Uh, you want to right click and save the world. Now this right clicking and saving the world will put in your flappy world automatically create the ground objects, ground, ground two, ground three, ground four, uh, exactly at the location that we dropped them. Okay, um, and we can add in our flappy bird as well. And we want flappy to be just about right there, about 50 down and about 50 to the right. Okay, sometimes when you try to save the world or reset the world, um, or after you save the world for a second time, it will remember where you moved an object and then it will move it back um, to where you relocated it one time. So we don't want these set locations in here. Um, if you make a big game like the maze game, that's what um, can happen if you make a lot of walls and save and move them. Um, so you want to take out those set locations. And then we're good to go. Okay, um, so now we need to make our pipes. And our pipes are going to act like an enemy. And so I'm going to make a new subclass. And I'm going to need to make both a bottom and a top pipe. So bottom pipe. And then we also need to create an enemy top pipe. And we want to set the image top pipe. So now that we've made our bottom pipe class and our top pipe class and given them images, we want them to be added into the world. Um, so we are going to simply go into Flappy Bird world. And wall. this world is running, we want um, pipes to constantly be coming and going from right to left across the screen. So we're going to need to access our act method. Um, it is not automatically put in your world class. So you actually need to set this up like this and type in public void act. Uh, and we're going to say we're going to have a account that constant. And I do this in games a lot. And so you have a count that constantly is running throughout your world. And then you're able to use that as kind of a timer. And uh, you're able to manipulate different things in your world using that. We're going to have int count equals zero to start. And since it's outside the act method, it'll never get reset to zero. That's just what it starts at, at the very, when the class flappy world is made. So right away. Okay, and then our count in the act method will always plus plus. No, we're going to make another method um, that will be called add pipes. So we're going to add our pipes in. When we invoke this method, we'll add our pipes in. So we're going to add our pipes in if count modulo 100 equals equals zero. Okay. Now, what is this modulo? Well, what it does is it divides whatever count is by 100 and then checks what's left over. If count was 100 and you divided it by 100, the remainder would be zero because they're divisible by each other. If count was 101, you would divide by 100, and the remainder of 101 divided by 100 would be 1 in this in that case. If it was 110, it would be 1. It would just be 10, and so on and so forth. So, so if our count divided by 100 equals 0, has a remainder of 0, is divisible by 100, we are going to add in our objects, and so. Basically every six, this is happens 60 times per second. So every one and two thirds of a second, we're going to add in a add object, new bottom pipe at a certain X value and a certain Y value. Well, so our X value want to be at the right edge of the world all the way over here. If this is zero and our width is 800. Um, you could put 799, but that's bad practice. In case I want to change the width of my world at some point, I will use the method to get the width of the world, and then I'll subtract that by 1, because that number would include, 
or would not include zero. So it would the get width would give me 800, and actually the right edge of the world is 799. So there would be an error if you just did get world dot get width. You have to subtract by one. And then the height on the bottom pipe should be pretty low. So it should be around oh. 600 is the Y value, I'd say at least 550. So that gives me 50 pixels of space below it in the world. Um, and since we're already in the world, I don't need to do get world. So that's why this error pops up. So all I have to do is get with. So now I'm gonna add object new top pipe dot get with minus one comma 50, so 50 from the top. Now this will give us a, quite a bit of space, but we want to first do step by step and kind of test this game out and then we can make some modifications as we go. So when we run, nothing would happen because I have left add pipes out of the act method. Of course, always got to check that act method. Okay, um, so we run and these pipes are getting added in, okay? So a couple things I've noticed. First of all, it's good that they are not adding way, way too many in. If I run, it takes a second, then they add one in. They've probably added two, three maybe. Okay, so they've added two in. But these pipes are way too small. We want them way bigger. We want it challenging to get through in between them. So I've noticed that we want, we're not gonna scale down an image, we're gonna scale up the image. Okay, so let's look back at our all objects code where we have scaled down image. Is there any way we could make this um, go up? Well, uh, so we don't have a method for scaling up an image, but we can pretty e quickly and easily do a little copy and paste and do scale up image and we will just multiply scale up image multiply and multiply so this will make it so that our pipes can use the so let's get to the bottom pipe we can create a constructor for bottom pipe public bottom pipe bottom pipe open close parentheses and we're going to scale up image and it needs two numbers to plug in there to multiply by that will make it way wider and way taller for the bottom pipe so that's what it looks like there um, now we need to do the top pipe um, and maybe make the bottom pipe a little bit smaller so instead of five and five let's do two and the height will be four. So we're gonna make it basically the same size there, but look how easy it is just to do a quick scale up image. Um, we don't have to remake any code. It just makes it a lot, a lot easier here. So if I create a public top pipe object, that will change all of our This constructor changes all type top pipes that get added in without an argument. Just anything that gets added in for these objects um, will scale up to 2.4. Okay, so now coming in, they might need to be moved a little bit because right now, the issue that we're going to run into is that these pipes get stuck because they can't go any higher up outside of the world because this is where the, this, the object can only go so far before it gets pulled back into the world because it's so large. Okay, so these objects can only get halfway before it gets pulled back to where it was. And so we need to make what we call uh, the boundaries. So we need to get rid of the boundaries. So we're going to make the world have no bound. So if we look at how the world class is constructed. Um, our world, the constructors, things that can construct the world, um, there's two different options you can go with. The, the normal that we use is the width, the height, and the cell size. But you can also do width, height, cell size, and Boolean bounded. Now this is saying whether or not the world has a boundary for it. 
And right now, we, by default, we do have a boundary, but we need to make it so that we don't. So we're gonna need to make this 800 by 600, one cell size, and then all we need to do is put false, and it knows that this is saying it is not bounded anymore. There are no boundaries. So now when we put in our top and bottom pipe here, we can put them at 650, size is 600, so outside the world, and then negative 50. We can see that when we run that, it makes the size of the spacing a little bit better, um, a little bit closer to what we're trying to do. Now, we need the bottom pipe to also move. And so, public void, move around. And they are just gonna fly across the screen, so this is gonna be pretty straightforward of a set we're not turning them or anything. We're going to set the location to get X minus speed because we're going right to left and we're going to need to create a instance variable speed. So int speed equals five. And then get Y. This will move us to the left across the screen once we put in our act method. Don't forget to do that. So now we're gonna see them flying across the screen on the bottom and you can kind of see the speed at which they're coming in and you can almost see how this game's gonna work. So we're gonna just copy and paste, move around. Um, could honestly be put in the enemies class, we could use it there, but it's a very short and simple bit of code, so we'll just do that. Okay, um, now when we run, something's a little bit off here, clearly. Speed is four in our top pipe. Ah, see, so, um, it will find speed from another class that we've made available to us. So it was grabbing the enemy speed or mover speed. So it must have been the mover speed. Yeah, mover speed is four. Okay, so be careful with that. Um, now it has a local variable that it can use, and so um, it doesn't need to go outside of the class to look for the ver another speed variable that it can inherit from a super class. Okay, now we're gonna put in, finally, put in gravity for our Flappy Bird. So in order for the Flappy Bird to fall due to gravity, we're gonna need to create a variable gravity, and we'll set it equal to zero because if you are suspended in midair, your gravity is zero until you get dropped, and then it starts after that. So we start at zero as the gravity. So um, in your act method, you're gonna actually have gravity increase. Gravity is gonna plus plus. The reason that is, is because when you fall, you are going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So gravity would affect you down one and then two and then three. And so you're, you, you would increase your speed of your gravity as you fall down. And so we want our gravity to continuously increase, um, which makes us fall. But we are going to have to have a jump, public void jump method. And this jump method will say if greenfoot dot is key down space, it'll be spacebar to jump. And then if space is down, we want gravity to equal negative 24. Okay, I've done the tests and I, I like negative 24. Um, but so right now these are just numbers. Gravity will count up, up, and up, and then gravity will be set to negative 24 if I put jump in the act method uh, when space bar is down. But we want we need a method that will also be for falling. That'll be our fall method. And it will say, it'll use gravity and it'll say set 
location get x so our x value is not going to change because we're actually the pipes are coming towards us and it looks like we're flapping towards the pipes but the pipes are actually coming towards us and so flappy will will change its y value based off of gravity so the y value if it was 50 and gravity started off it would be 0 and then 1 so our y value would be 51, and then 50, then it would be up two more, so it would be 53, then up three more, 56, then up four more, 60, and then it goes up and up and up and up, faster and faster and faster. So if our fall um, method and our jump method are in our act method, we can see that we will fall and jump all across our screen now. I'm jumping a little higher than I want to, but I kind of like how that, that's working for me. So a couple things here, we're, uh, we're falling too fast. Uh, nothing happens when we go too high or too low, and um, nothing happens when we hit the pipes. So the first thing we're gonna look at is our fall, and just the, having the location just get reset constantly, it's just too fast, too quickly. And our gravity, it's an integer, so it can't really go down any slower. Um, there are other ways that we'll, we'll learn later how you can make the gravity fall slower, but we're gonna make our own way. Um, and we're gonna create what we call a modulo. And um, we just did that when we were adding in our pipes. So we're gonna do this again, but instead of having our pipes add in every 100, counts we're gonna have this if statement happen every other count so we're gonna have an int count equals zero the same way we set it up in our world we're gonna say count plus plus right here and then we're gonna say if count modulo 2 equals equals zero meaning count must be divisible by two so it must be an even number so every other um this will execute and actually we're going to start using one line if statements and so if you only have one command you just have set location or just have setting gravity to negative 24. you don't need curly brackets around it so um, just writing it out like this is absolutely fine. And uh, we're going to start just kind of practicing and seeing what places we can use that to try to make our code get written a little faster. Um, I personally like to throw them in there just so if we need them, if we need to add an extra command or method to it, uh, it'll be there. Okay, um, so now let's check our fall. Let's see how this is falling. Oh yeah, that's a lot better. Okay, all right, so now we need to change our Flappy Bird. So if it hits public void hit edge, if uh, is touching the ground class, ground.class we want to lose the game but we also want to check if we hit the top or the bottom of the world so um, there is what we call a logical operator there's an or an and um, and a few others and we're going to use the or and so if you hold shift down and click the button between the backspace and enter or on a Mac, delete and return. And you, you're holding shift down, it'll make these lines. And this li these lines signify an or. So if is touching ground class or, or get y equals equals zero, meaning it's at the top of the screen, or our get y equals equals get world dot get height 
minus 1. So this would get the very bottom of our world, get the height minus 1. All of that in an if statement that we'll just start it off with greenfoot dot stop. Okay, and then we can check this to make sure it works so there's no errors that pop up before compiling or while compiling. And then um, copy and paste this guy in here. <clears throat> so now, oh, we hit the ground. Hmm. Get y is not checking if it's equal to zero. Or get y equals equals zero. How about less than or equal to one? Now it stops. Okay. So it stops when we hit the bottom, we hit the ground, stops if we hit the top. Now I am noticing something. If I hold down space, I do not want my Flappy Bird to keep going up. So I want the jump method to only happen once when you press spacebar down, and then you have to let go of the spacebar in order for it to happen again. And so right now you can just hold spacebar down and it keeps going up, up, up. Okay, so we're going to create a local Boolean. Okay, and if you remember, Boolean is a true-false statement. So Boolean um, jump pressed. And naturally, jump pressed will start off as false because you will not automatically be jumping to start the game. So if greenfoot dot is key down space and, so two ampersands is the, lo the logical operator for and, um, and jump pressed is false, which you can just do jump pressed with an exclamation point in front of it signifies false. Just putting jump pressed would signify true. So jump, if the space is down and jump pressed is false, we need to add back in those curly brackets that we took out. And we need to set jump pressed because we just jumped. We executed the jump right here. Oops. We executed the jump button and we've our gravity switched to negative 24. So we don't want that to continue happening. So we're, so we're going to set jump pressed from false to true here. And then if green foot is not pushed down, spacebar is not down. We're going to have jump pressed equal false. Switch it back. And then the next time you push it down, jump pressed will be back to false. Because when space is not pushed down, jump pressed will switch back to false. And you'll be able to push space again. And it'll go to negative 24, but then jump pressed will be true. So holding it down will not work anymore. And if you notice, you're not jumping as high because your space isn't executing multiple times. It's only executing one time. So that's exactly how we want it. And that looks great. Okay, now we need to say if the flappy bird hits the pipes also. So hit edge is going to change to hit, hit something and hit something because I want to be very descriptive and it, this would this just means that it's hitting anything um, don't want there to be any confusion so if it is touching ground dot class or is touching enemies dot class 
since top pipe and bottom pipe are going to be the only enemies that are going to be in our world, we can just put the enemy super class. So that would include enemy flyer and enemy walker, but they're not going to be in our our game. Um, so is touching enemies dot class should work out great. Now we need to test that. Perfect. Okay, now we're getting there, getting somewhere. So um, we are going to change where the pipes are going to be. So um, yeah, having them just be in the same spot over and over again does not work out for us. So um, also, I would like for the gravity, if we hit the edge or get removed, our gravity go back to zero because our gravity is staying at negative 24. If we hit the top of the screen and it, we start off with a jump, and we don't want that. So if we hit something, we're also, before greenfoot.stop, going to have our gravity just set back to zero. Just good little test that worked and showed us that we don't want our gravity to be negative when we start off the game. So no matter what, now our gravity will be back to zero when we hit something. So now I'd like my Flappy Bird to have a little bit better animation and falling look to it besides just falling flat. In the real game, um, the Flappy Bird will tilt down um, as it's falling. So we are going to create a way for it to tip. So I created my tipping method call. Now we're going to create our tipping method. So our tipping method will say that we are going to set our rotation because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change our rotation. So we're going to set our rotation to the current rotation. So we're going to access the rotation with the get rotation method. That'll give us our current rotation. And then we are going to add to to that rotation and that'll just tip us forward slowly and so we will constantly be tipping and rolling right now but we're going to change that so that when we push space down it'll turn us back up and so when we push jump I'm now going to set my rotation every time I push my space to negative 75 which will turn us to about at 285 degrees at negative 75 so now every time we jump we tilt up but we're also always tipping down okay so now we're gonna have our pipes move slightly randomly we, we've done a good job so far of having them stuck in a pretty decent spot but it would be nice if we have them randomly either shift down but all of them shift down or all of them shift up and so um, we're going to go into our world and we're going to use a random number and um, Greenfoot has created a class the Greenfoot class that um, will give us a random number so if we do control space we can do a get random number, and this integer are, is the limit of the number. So the limit would be, for us, we're going to do 6 semicolon. Now what that means is every time count is divisible by 100, and we add in pipes, Greenfoot's going to get a random number um, between 0 and 5. And actually we want um, ran random num equals we want to reset random num every time um, we add in a new pipe and we are going to manipulate these numbers a little bit um, so that we can add in this random number uh, and make make that change and the reason that we have <clears throat> just one integer here is that we want these to both affect top and bottom pipe equally so the space between the pipes stay the same um, but they just move where they're at on the screen and we have six different places kind of that we can put um, 
our random number. So we're going to actually change both of these numbers. We're going to do um, 450 plus 50 times random num. And then we're going to do negative 200 plus 50 times random num. Okay, now we're going to compile that. And, oh, we have a pipe that's up high, in the middle, up high, middle lower, all the way down by the ground. Excellent. So this will give an extra challenge to the Flappy Bird game. Beautiful. Okay. So um, now what we're going to do is create a score counter up here at the top uh, so that our score can continuously add up as we go. Um, and now this is a little bit more complex object-oriented programming that we're going to uh, learn right now. So first we're going to create a, a counter class. And that is something that we want to be able to use with all of our players. Uh, in particular. And so uh, we want to make sure it's under the all objects class so that the enemies could access it if we wanted to um, negatively affect the score and the players could access it in case we want to positively increase the score. So just in all. A new subclass of all objects we're going to call it counter. And we're actually going to design our own image for counter so we actually don't need to set our image to anything. Um, we're going to go ahead and go into counter and we're going to create a constructor for our counter that has no parameters. Um, and our counter, we're going to set our image for our counter. Um, now, what can we do when we set our image of our counter? It says we can either have a string that will just set an image for this actor from an image file so we can grab a, a, an image file that's a string and just plug in that the name of that file there but we want to design our own so we're going to create a new green foot image so we're going to set image and we're going to create a new green foot image and now our options from a new green foot image if we look at in our world class so if I just double click on world here, I can open up the tree that shows all of our different classes. And now the Greenfoot image class has different constructors that are available. One is just, so create a Greenfoot image from another Greenfoot image, create an empty transparent image with the specified size, create an image from an image file we've talked about. Um, we can do a string, size, foreground, background, that's what we're looking at there. So then we can do size, string, size, foreground, background, and outline, but we're just going to do green foot image with string, size, foreground, and background. So this one right here. Okay, um, so back in our counter, we're gonna do a string, and that will be score, space, and notice it turns green because I put quotes around it, which signifies that this is a string or a string of characters or text. Okay, and then a comma. So that was the string. Now we need, need to have text size. I'm going to have it be 70. And that's just general pixel size. Um, so that would be pretty big. We'll take a look at how that looks. And then we're going to do um, foreground color. Um, so in the foreground, um, let's have it be white, and then the background, uh, let's try to see what blue looks like on the blue background. So we have one, two, few parentheses, so make sure you get those both in there. Now we should be set, so when I add in my counter, Oh, there it is. We have our score right there. OK, 
Okay, so just add in one of those. Um, we'll turn the size down to 50. I like the white, but let's change this blue to black. The background. Now, it looks it's pretty basic, but that's all we need right now. Okay, um, so we have our score. And it's not automatically going to count for us. And actually, we need to constantly be updating it. And so we are going to have to create a score variable um, that we implement into our code. So we need to do plus score. Now, the reason we do a plus is because it's called concatenating a string. So we have our string, and we want to combine it with an integer value. Um, or a different data type, or even if it's another string, but we want to combine it into one, essentially one long string. And so that's what concatenating means. Um, I wanted to pause for a moment and make sure you guys were aware of something. This new Greenfoot image is an object because we're using the keyword new to signify we want a new Greenfoot image. The reason we're able to do that is because we've imported the Greenfoot class, which stores world class, actor class, Greenfoot image class, Greenfoot class, as well as the mouse info class. And so when we create a new Greenfoot image, um, we are just grabbing from that class. Just like when we add an object into our own world, um, this is just creating a Greenfoot image object that we grab from the Greenfoot class. And so we are actually gonna not only do that, we want it to always be happening in our game. And so we want to copy and paste this into the act method so it's always setting the image to the most updated image. So we're not adding an object in here. We're just making sure that our counter object is the image is set to the new greenfoot image and so the image is always updating so in case score changes which it will um, we have it in the act method so that it always is updating so let's go ahead and throw this counter in there one more time and look now we have zero okay so before we add in this counter let's we need to this is very important so the way we are going to add in the score counter we need to do it manually and I'll tell you why here in a second. So the location is 90 by 90, 30, okay? So in our flappy world, we wanna prepare and we wanna just add in a counter, counter equals new counter. So we've set up a variable that we're referencing the counter class so we know this variable is gonna, going to access the counter class and create a new object, new instance of the counter class. So just one. Um, and so we're going to add object counter at, what we say, 90, 30. Okay, now in our world, have our score and we want when we pass the pipes or score to go up then your counter needs to be able to add score so we're going to create a method for that public void add score now in order for it to add score we want to be able to say how much of the score we want to add so we are going to uh, create a parameter for this method that it has to have the score um, score up and I'm going to change the name of this variable um, for now and so um, if add score so if we have that method going we will um, have score up which is available to this method um, and we will set our current score for this 
equal to score up, but then score up would need to change. So we are going to actually do score equals score plus score up, which can be shortened to just score equals plus score up, and it will add up whatever's in this parameter every time you score. This add object is only referencing the information that is given in the prepare method, which is essentially nothing. And so we need to have be able to access, we want to access the counter class. And so what we need to do is we need to move this outside outside of the prepare method and put it at the top of the class. So it's very important that that is your first step that you move that counter counter equals new counter outside, outside of the, the prepare method so we can access it with any method in the class. So very quickly right there, I did something that is really important that we understand. I've created a reference for the new counter that we're adding in and it's called lowercase counter. So now whenever I reference lowercase counter Greenfoot and Java know that I am trying to grab the counter that I created outside of all of the prepare method and this counter that I've created is accessible throughout the entire class just by moving it outside the prepare method just on its own in the class it's able to be referenced by these other methods so now that, that counter is outside of the prepare method it's able to be communicated with um, with anything in the world class in that flappy world class, it can access anything from the counter. And what we're going to access is the score. So before our counter was a local variable, and it was local specifically to the method. Okay, it wasn't an instance variable and a static variable. Sometimes is called the entire class variable. But this local variable is only local to the method that we created. And so here, int x equals get x, int y equals get y. So while we're inside the move around method the x and y value are get x and get y. Outside of it, it is not available to us. Just like in an if statement, if I were to initialize it, it also works inside of that. So inside of an if statement or a loop, if you put x or y, or, or put in x or int y, and you initialize a variable or create it inside of the actual if statement, that will also only be local to the if statement or to the loop. Okay, so now that we've created counter counter equals new counter so we've created a name for the counter that we're going to use throughout okay we first can still add the object counter in the prepare method which we've already done but what we also are going to be able to do and I'll show you in a minute is we're able to reference our add score method right from which counter oh the counter that we created up here okay so if you wanted more than one counter you would need to create a second reference to a second counter and then you would need to add that in and then you would need to counter to add score okay in case we wanted to have one counter be for pipes passed and another counter could be five points uh, and we could just count up um, so we just want the one but what's cool is we've just done something that we haven't done before, and that's the ability to communicate with other classes. You don't you don't actually just do that with um, within the world. You could also, in some games, and I will show you. You will also be able to, in some games, um, be able to have multiple people if they all act the same or have some of the same um, behaviors, but they have different characteristics notice how I'm, how I'm wording this remember a class has both <clears throat> traits and physical characteristics and they also have behaviors well these people in this simulation have different names um, but some and traits but they have some of the same behaviors and so no matter which teacher I select they will be the selected person and they will have a label and they will have a name and so this constructor that I create gives them a name and the label uses the name that is given okay and then if it's clicked 
this person, whoever this person is and their name, gets passed through the world. So now this character can move around, but no matter which person I choose, they are all able to have the same behavior, so the same methods, and the only method really uh, in the act method is just moving, okay? Um, but they're also able to communicate between the labels that they create, the different worlds that they go into. So this is what you get to look forward to going into next. Um, and we'll do a little bit about inheritance um, and being able to pass parameters. So um, being able to reference different classes within each other is, is a very big, big part. And we'll get into that in our next, in our next video. This concept can also be applied to uh, Eclipse or IntelliJ. Um, here we had just have a simple program that you can enter your name, your age, and then the program will print. Your name is whatever you've entered your name as, and your age is whatever you've entered your age as. Um, but we've also given it, created a person class so that we could create more than one person and store their information. And so. Um, here we are just referencing person yourself equals new person and so just like in in Greenfoot when we have created an entire class um, maybe somewhere else in our code um, and it, it might show up in a different box but we are able to reference um, any we could reference the person class just by doing person yourself equals new person um, just like counter, counter equals new counter, um, we can reference the counter class, even though it's not visible on our screen, um, it is still a class we have available to access. So that's how we do it. Counter, counter equals new counter. And then we are also able to reference the methods that are in the counter, or in this case person, um, within our own class now that we have referenced uh, the counter. And so here we have your name is yourself dot get name. And so it gets the name from person and it plugs it in right there. For our code, we would, we're going to do counter dot add score. Um, and we're able to reference the counter class um, because we created a reference for it. And then now we're going to get our counter to function. And we're going to have our counter function in a way that we're going to count until we pass a pipe. And that number, so right about there, we can check with our Flappy Bird or in the world and check, okay, our count is about 240. So just when it gets past this part, um, we will score. So now that we have our counter getter method available, we're now going to create a Boolean method that will check time to score. So it's going to check if it's time to score. Um, and so if our count equals equals 240. So if count is equal to 240, we're going to return true. Also, if count is greater than 301 and so if count is greater than 300 and count plus 60 so that will take whatever count is which we're trying to get to count at 3 340 and 440 and 540 all to set it to true because every 100 beats after this first count the next wave of pipes are going to be passing our flappy bird so if count plus 60 modulo 100 equals equals zero as a remainder of zero, we will return true, okay? There's one, two, 
and we have a working counter. Excellent. Now, um, you can finish it with a U win screen. Uh, we already have one here. So we can just say a U win method and create public void you win and we will what we'll do with this you win is say if and we'll access the counter one more time and do counter dot uh, well, we need to get the score, the score of the counter. Um, so we're going to do counter.score. Equals equals five. Add object new you win screen in capital. So you know that you want to capitalize each one of these letters because it's a class, the you win screen class, um, and you're gonna lowercase all these methods because they are methods, and so you know the difference with these um, parentheses. With these parentheses, you wanna make sure you know the difference between a method and a class. So we're gonna add that get world dot get with divided by two, get world, Oh, I don't even need the get worlds. We're in the world class. What am I doing? Okay, get world divided by two. Or excuse me, get width divided by two. Get height divided by two. Um, and that should be just about it. Um, and then we need to greenfoot dot set world new my world so we go back to our my world class okay and, and let's try to get five points here so get our score to five so one two three four five and then we get added into the added back into my world so let's let's open up our flappy world and we're going to need to change a little bit of something so this shows up for more than a second here so um, we're going to do a greenfoot dot delay. We're going to delay for about uh, two seconds so you can see that screen. And so what I'm going to do is add score five. And you're going to get a U win screen that shows up for two seconds and then you fly back to your world. Um, and we need to Take a nice screenshot for the world and then have a picture of it so that we have a platform for our Flappy world. And now you've created your own Flappy Bird game. Okay, so once we get a good little picture here, you can actually manipulate it. The last thing we're going to do um, is we're going to go into our Flappy world real quick. We're going to go in our prepare method and say set paint order. And then you just say what class you want first. Um, and so we want our counter.class, our flappy bird dot class. You would want our U win screen first. So we just want the counter out in front and then flappy bird second. So those are the two things that um, I want to make sure is in the paint order. So that when we pass over here, the score shows up in front. And I'm going to do Control Shift, Command Shift Four, and take a little screenshot here. Go back into our My World setup. We're going to need to do a Flappy Bird game pick. Um, so we're going to do Flappy Bird game pick. Oh, that's a mouthful, but um, then we're going to set this image. We're going to import from our screenshots recent 
and I can get this flappy bird in there and I can easily go in and create a constructor to scale it down. So remember a constructor is the name of the class and this is what um, specific object we are going to enter into the world and so we are going to scale down. So scale down image um, what is it? Three by three we'll try first. So when I add my flappy bird in, that's pretty good size. Pretty good size. So we got flappy bird up here. We can save the world now. Um, make it so that if our ship player is touching maze game um, is right there, but we're going to not reinvent the wheel. So we're just going to do a little copy and paste. Um, and instead of maze game, we're just going to call it flappy game and flappy bird game pick. Enter flappy game. Oh, uh, it'll take us, <laughs> it'll still take us to our maze world because this says set world new maze world. We need a flappy world. Okay, now we can go and enter our flappy bird game. Uh, and I think when we create this game, I think to start off, just to give us the opportunity to have a little bit of direction on Flappy Bird. So we're going to do a show text command in Greenfoot, or excuse me, in the world class. And all we have to do here is put a string, which is a set of words um, or letters strung together, uh, and our X value and our Y value. So I'm just going to put it in the middle of the world. So we're going to do get width divided by 2 get height divided by two. Okay, um, space to jump. You win when you get, we'll switch it to 10 points for the you win. Okay. Um, So I'm going to put greenfoot.delay. Um, so I'm going to put if count equals equals zero. I'm going to greenfoot.delay for five seconds. So right at the beginning of the world, once it's initiated um, and we enter into that world, we're going to have a five second delay, space to jump. You win when you get to 10 points. Okay. Now we just need to remove that text. So we are going to actually add that text only if count is equal to zero. Okay, so we're going to have to put curly brackets on this now because it's more than one uh, set of commands. And we'll paste this text. We're going to have to do an else show text it to the same exact coordinates uh, as above and just have an empty string or null. And so we'll try the empty string. So we'll run one, two, three, four. Okay, now it disappears, and now we're off and running, and we have our fully functional Flappy Bird game. Cheat my way through, and I win. Congratulations, you've now completed Chapter 2. At this point, 
I would recommend going into Greenfoot and designing a game of your own. You've created two games. Uh, you're able to move around the screen and control one of the players. You're able to move enemies in a variety of ways, uh, bouncing off walls, wrapping at edge. Um, you've learned how to use gravity uh, within your game. So a few games that I've we've created in the past are some asteroid shooter games, a platformer game, um, a frogger game. We will do all of those, or you're able to do all those. I have videos posted for um, doing any of those games if you want, um, but I suggest trying to do something completely on your own. Struggle for a little bit, look through the Greenfoot API library to really search and find uh, some things that you want to do. The, the only way you can really hone these skills um, is by Try and go out and trying to do some of these things on your own. We did a lot more advanced um, passing parameters. Uh, you passed integer values into the scale down image. We passed a, another integer value for the greenfoot dot delay, and then finally we passed the amount we wanted the score to go up in our counter. We did a lot of variable manipulation in this game, um, specifically gravity um, and pulling that gravity down but we also manipulated the counter variable. Um, we used the modulo, modulus operator, that uh, percent sign to find the remainder. Uh, we created a score counter, um, just a, a beginner score counter. We'll find a, another way to create a score counter later on, a little more advanced. Um, we used the exclamation point, the not true operator. So if something is not true, um, we used that. Uh, we also used the increment operator, so this plus plus adds one to the variable. Did a lot of inheritance, uh, whether it was the scale down image or having a super, the super classes of our subclass, uh, the pipes and the ground. Uh, the or and and operator, we use that multiple times throughout our code and, and really feel like we have a good grasp of that. So next we're gonna be creating a snake game. And in this snake game, you're gonna have two players and they're gonna be able to move around the screen gather food and their tails are going to disappear as they fall behind you and you can't run into your own tail or the opponent's tail thinking about all we've done so far um it's it's really quite impressive the maze game we learned how to control our player using the keyboard uh, we're able to collect things and remove objects from the world if one player is touching another um and you're you're you were able to learn how to interact with the Java library and look at different AP, Greenfoot API that is available to you in different areas of your code. And so here's the world class. You, you learn the get world method, how to access world information, um, as well as inside of the actor classes, um, learning how to move around both with gravity here in the Flappy Bird game, uh, as well as move around the screen in the maze runner just with the keyboard you have your code very organized if you followed along the way I have um, and you've learned a lot of techniques along the way like camel case lowercase uppercase uppercase for methods and then knowing where classes are um, so you know the difference between the two because they're capitalized making it very easy to spot is key down is obviously a method um, understanding parameters um, just like all of the code that we get, like is key down was created, but it must have a string um, in order for the method to work. And so you were able to access the library that required different um, uh, information and different parameters. Like here in the scale parameter, it needed an X value and a Y value. Um, and so you learn that you need to plug in a number. It expects an integer value for dot scale. In our maze game, we also learned how to make enemy walker and enemy flyer, uh, two different types of enemies. Um, and we were able to use the Boolean parameter here. So that means whenever an enemy walker is created, it requires a true or false uh, statement, whether it's going up and down or side to side. Um, we learned how to create a constructor, which is the physical properties and characteristics that you can put in a single object. So this is what the object would look like uh, when you create it. So we can access the image, uh, choose whether it's moving up or down based off the, if this is true or false. We've learned how to use the or operand as well as the equal assignment. So knowing that speed equals negative speed. 
uh, would set speed to the opposite direction. Speed would equal negative speed. Um, we have used access some of these methods, like hit walls, um, from superclasses. So if we checked in our enemies, we have this rapid edge code. And so this would actually be in the enemy flyer. It can access the rapid edge code because it extends the enemies class. So we learned quite a bit about inheritance and how you can make subclasses of, of different things. Um, we've utilized um, a counter so that we can increase something as we go through the act method. We learned the modulus sign that would be whatever this number is divided by two, this would be the, the remainder or the leftover fraction. So if any number was odd, there would be a fraction of one over two. So the remainder would be one. And so then it wouldn't execute for numbers that were odd because there is a remainder. If you do an odd number divided by two, this would mean zero remainder. So it would be an even number because when you divide by two, there is zero remainder. Um, and it will makes the gravity only go every time, every other time you run through the act method. I've actually used bad naming conventions here. Um, having these as uppercase letters is incorrect. And bad practice. So I'm going to go ahead and change that. We've also learned how to access different classes and uh, be able to make references um, to access a certain class. So we know up here we're telling, you know, it'd be nice that we know it's public, even though everything has access to the world, so you don't necessarily need it public, because technically the world is a superclass of any of the, any actor object. But normally you'd want to do public counter counter equals new counter. Um, this would allow you to create a counter, uh, a reference to counter. So anytime we use counter, it knows which counter we're talking about. It's the one that's already been added in to our counter class um, in the prepare method. And whenever we put counter.score, that'll reference the value um, of score, variable score that's created inside of our counter class. And then... Um, Count.addScore, this is a method that we create on our counter class and we were able to access it by doing the lowercase counter because we're referencing this counter that we have added in right here. So it knows which counter we're talking about. Congratulations, you've worked really hard and now you're done with chapter two. Um, and we're going to review a little bit what, what we learned on chapter. A lot of what we learned in chapter two um, was a little bit more of a review of chapter one and making sure we really honed in on those skills and also um, using them in a more advanced way. Like we had if statements within if statements, we started using nested ifs, um, created variables that did a lot of different things, used our different arithmetic operators as well as assignment operators. Um, we did some, some logical operators using and, and, and then or, uh, we did a lot more with passing parameters uh, as well as creating a constructor class. And so a lot of these were some review, but really making sure we have some sh a sharp knowledge of some of these topics. And so you're through a lot of the basics here. And at this point, I think it would be um, unwise to add another game. Um, I really wanted to do this so you guys really understood inheritance. And it's a little bit sloppier than I would normally do, but you guys haven't learned all the necessarily all the things that we are about to learn. And so we have a little bit more classes than I normally would have. And um, it's a little bit more jumbled, but you got to learn a lot of the, the foundations without going to way too fast through things. In chapter three, we're going to be creating custom background images, uh, learn about class referencing, uh, and create an advanced score counter. And so uh, in our snake game, we're going to make objects of the same class look different. So our two snakes, one will be green, one will be blue. Um, they will do have some of the very similar behaviors, but they will look different and they will be controlled on the keyboard in different ways.
um, depending on which one we're, we're referring to or where we are referencing. Um, we're going to create the advanced score counter. We'll increase the score uh, when a snake actor eats the food actor. Uh, previously in our counter, we referenced information from the world class to our counter, but now we're going to reference information um, when the snake eats the food. Uh, our counter is going to go up in our world class, and our world class will say when we win the game. So um, there's not going to be any notes prior to the start of this lesson. Uh, we're just going to go through the snake game, and you guys are going to learn, and I will do a good job of explaining along the way. So I hope you're excited to get started on the snake game. So at this point, I'm going to create a new scenario, a new Java scenario, and we are going to create a, our snake game. The first thing we're going to do is want to go to my, my world snake game. Um, and so we want to be able to access our background and then we want to change the color of the background. So we want to be able to get the background. So this is a method and then you're going to set the color of that background that you just got. So this set color will need a, has a parameter that requires a color. So you do color dot black. And so we are able to build our my world just by getting the background and setting the color. It knows we're talking about the my world background. Okay, and then you can do get background dot fill. And that will fill the background. So we're, we've set the color of the background to black here. And then we've done our fill method right here. Okay, and now when we compile, now we have our black background, okay, entirely black. So we know we're going to have to have a players that are in this game, and we're creating a snake game, so we'll have two players. They will, one will be green, one will be blue, and they'll move around the screen. If they collect a certain amount of apples, they're going to win the game. Um, they cannot run into their own tail or their partner's tail. Um, or their other or the other players tail or they will lose so we're going we know we need to make a players class and we know we're going to be able to make a foods class player and our player is not going to have an image because we are going to design our own image here okay and so when we open our player we know we're going to need a constructor because we're going to need to be able to build the player um, the look of the player and we know we're going to need to have um, a color as well as um, their own controls. And within this constructor, we know that our players are going to be two different colors. So I'm going to give them a red, a green, and a blue um, set of parameters. Okay, and so I know that zero, zero, 255 will be blue, uh, red will be 255, zero, zero, green, zero, 255, zero. So I can create my different colors there. And then when I add a player into the world, we could do it in the constructor. We know that, that, that we're going to need to add the object into the constructor because before the game even starts, we want them in the constructor, but we don't want it local to just the constructor of the world. So we don't want to add it in there. So once again, like we made a counter in our Flappy Bird game, we are going to make a class for players. Player, blue player equals new player. And they will be 0, 0, 255. Because that's our blue player. And then player green player equals new player zero two fifty five zero okay and for now and if you want a red player it'd be two fifty five zero zero and you could mix and match to make different colors with that <clears throat> if you wanted other colored uh, players in our game Okay, so what we're going to need to do with that is now that we've made those two objects, 
we can add them in. Um, and so add object. See if I don't want to go look. Um, blue player, uh, comma, mm, their x and y value. Let's go ahead and make it 450, 100. And then add object green player at 150, 100. So let's change this 100 to 300. Now we will have two objects in the world and we'll start them both going up. Um, but now what do we do once we add these in? How do we communicate that these are getting passed to the player? Because they are. Okay, we've done it here. We've made a blue player and a green player. So how do we get this information? So they have been passed, but how do you receive them as the player? Well, you need to create um, different vari you need to create different variables that will match the variables in here um, that can be accessible in the player class. These can be received and read in the player class, but they cannot be stored um, unless you do it. Okay, so we can actually, if we're creating multiple integers, we can just do have them next to each other, um, especially if they are very related to each other. So we have all the colors RGB, and you can do this R, so the R that is this instance of R, whatever it is. Okay, so whichever one in the game it is, this is an instance of R will be whatever R got passed to it. And so in our game, both of the players had zero red get passed to it, but our R equals R. Okay, and then this dot G equals G. This, which the green had 255 passed to it, but the blue object, the blue player, did not have anything passed to it. Okay, and then this B equals B. Okay, so now that we have this, whatever instance we're talking about, we have their R, G, and B, we need a set image. Um, excuse me, we need a get image similar to the background image. We need to access the current image of the player. And we are going to set their color just like um, the background. We're gonna do a new color. And we're going to put R, G, and B in there. And that way, whichever player we're adding into the world, whether it's the blue or the green, um, they're going to have their own color. And then we're going to get image dot uh, fill a rectangle image, uh, 0, 0, 40, 40. Um, starts us at 0, 0 of where we're adding the object in and then it grows to 40, 40. Now we have our green and blue player in, but we want them to move a little bit. So first I'm gonna set their rotation. So they're facing up, 270 rotation. I'm gonna do that for both of them. And I've already done it for both of them. Okay, so they start facing up. And now I want them to move um, and we'll go ahead and put speed in there and we'll create a variable for speed and speed equals three don't want to move too crazy fast now that we have speed in we can go test real quick and it shows both of them are moving up at the correct speed and then we are going to need to create um, if statements greenfoot dot is key down um, right we can set the rotation um, to 90 to 0 okay and we can indent that correctly if green foot dot is key down left one 
180. Copy, paste, paste. And let's change these. Back to 270 and down to 90. Okay, so now we can move along the screen with both players. We're going to have to change that up a little bit later if we want to have one controlling the other. But let's go ahead and make the tail. Okay, and so our tail needs to be another actor. So our tail, we're gonna go in and we are gonna public tail. And we are going to need to create a way for the tail to access the RGB of the player and make sure that it is the same color. So when we create our tail, we need to make sure our tail is able to um, get the colors, or receive the colors uh, of the of the player. So we need to have its own R, G, and B, and R, G, B. Same as before, this dot r equals r, this dot g equals g, this dot b equals b. Okay, and the way they are going to receive this is when we go into our player, we're going to add in the player's RGB and pass it to the tail so that the tail has the same. Um, characteristics as whatever player we're talking about. Okay, and so now the tail receives this RGB, but it needs to do something with it. So we need to get image dot is that color just like before. New color R and we know what's referencing the R of the tail, but it's setting that when it gets the R of the player. G B and then get image dot fill rectangle zero zero forty forty. So now when we run it, they will have the tail follow along, and we've made you know a nice little game here. Okay, now we need to make sure. First of all, the tail doesn't go on forever, but we have the colors of the tail because we got them passed to us from the player's RGB. Okay, so this is referencing it from the player, and it's plugging it in to the tail, and it's st the tail storing it with these, but it's receiving it through this. Okay, and so with our tail in the act method, we want to have another count for our tail. And we want this tail to disappear so it looks like it's following along. Because before, we just run it and it just is a cool looking tail. But if we have it disappear from behind, um, we actually have a ton of, if we pull out, see these are all a bunch of little objects and we're first of all going to run out of space probably at some point. Um, and it'll be working Greenfoot too hard and it might crash. So we want to delete following behind and we'll have a count equals zero to start and then if count we'll have count plus plus so it just adds up the whole time and if our count equals is greater than um, 60 so every second the, it'll last for one second to start um, you're going to, for now, just get world dot remove object this. So that's referencing this instance. 
So each one will have its own counter. So after one second, it'll follow along. And now you have a nice little tail to start your game. Okay, um, so now we're going to create a another layer of the player uh, so that it can have more than just the four um, directions and it, each player can have a different um, direction. So int um, player, so our players are going to either be a, a, one, a zero or a four. And so in our my world, we need to add another one that's the blue player can be zero and the green player can be a four. And so what this allows us to do is now we have one player that's a zero, one player that's a four, and we can access that player int, and we can add that on right here to make another player integer. You need to make sure you create that variable. Um, and since these are all together, I can put commas next to them. I prefer to put these alone when there's something different, but these are all our parameters. So the player, um, so here we're going to have to do a nested if statement. So if player, remember that's the variable of this player, we'll do this dot, although we don't need to, um, but just to reiterate it, if this dot player equals equals zero, and right, left, up, or down is pushed. So if we do Command Shift I, you can see how this adjusts. All these get moved out in the correct spot. Um, and then I'm gonna copy that, paste it, and if this dot player equals four, they're gonna have different commands. Um, they can have right D, A, W, S. You need to make sure you set your player to this dot player equals player. And then this dot and this dot. Now you have different snakes able to do all sorts of different things. Okay, um, now we need to have some sort of damage done. Um, but before that, let's go ahead and create our counters. And so we're going to have our counter class. Counter, blue counter equals new counter. Counter, green counter equals new counter. And we're going to add object blue counter at 450, 50 green counter at one fifty fifty okay so now just need to do what the green and blue counters look like And actually, I'm going to change 450 to 550 and 50, 150 to 50. Okay, and then I'm going to have the counters. You need to create the physical properties, characteristics of the counter. So you need to create a constructor to construct your counter. So with our counter, we're going to set the image to a new green foot image. Um, 
and the new green foot image is going to be a string then to font size and then foreground and then background so color dot black color dot white so these once they have text in there would be the location of our string so if we want to put a little bit of text like our score then we can put that in there and that might be a little bit big so we can change that to about 30 I think that'll be just about right okay here we go score okay and then um, once we have that we need to have int speed, oh, int score equals zero to start. And we want to make sure that's public because we're going to be accessing that in different places. And then we want this to be not only in our constructor, but also in our act method because um, our act method is going to update our score. And so we need to this is a string um, and it's that's what's required here but we need to make a our variable that's an integer turn into a string so when you add this plus or sometimes uh, later on you'll do parentheses is called concatenating and it just makes um, the value turns this make sure that this is a string so whatever's in front or concatenating a string you had to have to do a plus with numbers, you would do int or double um, or boolean. Um, but for our string right here, we want a plus score and plus score. And this will live once we add the score method, um, it'll up live update the score as we go. Okay, and so our score is zero, score is zero and it can go up as we go um, once we create that method so let's go back into our counter class and create that method so public void add score and we are not going to have a parameter passing to it because we're just going to add score up by one um, just to have a regular count when we go back Our score needs to add a score when we eat food. So we're going to create our food. And our food is going to have the same code as our player. Actually, it's going to have the same code as our tail. So here we can copy and paste, uh, but we are going to be food, and we can have a count as well because I want our food um, to disappear if our count is greater than 400. Get world dot remove object this. Okay. And then we're going to go to our world and we're going to add food in randomly all across the screen. So we need to do a public void, finally create an act method for our world. And we are going to um, count plus plus our world. And we can just do int count equals zero. So if our count is greater than 100, we will add object new food, and they will be red. look like apples 
and they will be located greenfoot dot get random number um, get width minus one copy comma get height minus one I believe the parentheses are correct oh. okay so we create a new food that's red and we have the x value be located greenfoot dot get random number with minus one close parenthesis here that's what we'll take out the parenthesis back here Okay, it's because this is going to be the random number that we're going to get, um, and it's the height of our world. So anywhere between zero and the, the height of our world, then it's going to be completely random. And this is going to be anywhere from zero to the width of our world. Which I don't need, think you need to do minus one, but I'm going to do it just in case. So I think it goes zero to just before the edge of the world. So... There goes our apples, and they're getting added in, oh, nearly immediately. So we need to change something, because count is consistently greater than 100. So we're going to need to change count back to 0. And this has to be inside the if statement. And then Command-Shift-I, there we go. And now... There it is. Okay, and then we can add another one. And they disappear. Okay, and we have about four up at a time, so that's that's pretty good, I think. Um, I'm going to make the size of our world a little bit larger. So I'm going to go ahead and do 7 by 5. And we might need to add 500 to this and the location of the blue counter could be 650 and the height of the world could go up by 100. Players. Yeah, here we go. And now we want to actually add the score when we eat the food. So let's create a method for move around first. Public void move around. Let's go ahead and move that in here. Just to have Move around and then say eat food. So we're going to create an eat food method. So public void eat food if is touching food dot class. So we need to be able to access the counter from my my world, which we do. Um, but we need to be able to access which counter. And so we need to go back into our player and say if is touching food dot class and and player equals equals zero. Well, we know player zero is the blue player. So we need a way for our player to be able to access our my world class. Um, and then in, within that my world class, they want to be able to access the blue counter that we have stored for our my world class. Okay, and so if we go back into our player, 
they have the ability to access the my world class by doing my world my lowercase my world so we're we're creating another reference to our my world now and this is a little bit different we need to concatenate so remember when we turn like a string we had earlier in the counter we turn this string or excuse me this integer and morph it with the string now we're going to concatenate my get world method which grabs a world and we are going to make it of the type my world so we concatenated it to making it a my world class and then we're going to call it lowercase my world so that when i do my world dot i am referencing specifically the my world Uh, the get world of my world so like the current world that we're in we're accessing the world current world we're gonna make it of the my world class type which makes sense that that would fit because we're getting a cur the current world which is my world we're creating a reference for it okay so we can go into my world we can access blue counter because that is a method in my world and then within that that reference references to the counter class which has our add score method for our blue counter so dot would be another reference and then we can add score method now watch this this works and it compiles so when we're going if you look at our score we actually need to move this and have it only local because it, it gets confused it needs to be local only where it's used so only in this blue counter dot add score so now you can see if I move my score out a little bit my score for the blue counter going up and the score for the green doesn't do anything yet. So we have our own separate counters. So um, in our player, we're going to copy this and paste it. But if player is four, we're going to go to the green counter and add that score in. So there's our green counter going up and then our blue counter going up and now we need to make sure that food disappears so else if our food is touching player.class Get world dot remove object this oh. If our count length is greater than 10, we'll do 15 to start, and is touching player.class, you are going to get world dot add object new you lose get world dot get with divided by two get world dot get 
はい。What about you? And we need to make a you lose screen. We can do a game over screen for our you lose. Make sure you have these in the correct order. You can't have anything after the remove object this, or else it'll come up with an error. But there we go. If we run into ourselves, game over. We run into the other player, it's a game over as well. So we just need to have player, or excuse me, tail. We need to add the object. And then we're going to have a simple greenfoot.stop. If we lose, okay, and then in our counter, add a public void you win if score equals equals ten. Get world dot add object new win get world dot get with divided by two get world oh this beautiful get world dot get height divided by two, this beautiful code that you have to do over and over and over again. Gotta love it. Uh, and then you can do greenfoot.stop as well, and we can just end our game there. We don't need to go wasting any time on stuff we've done before. So, we need the you win screen, and we also need you win to be put in the act method. win we need a new actor called you win no not the best you win screen but that's what we're gonna work with okay so see who can get to 10 first We won. Okay, so if we have two players, hopefully 10 would be enough. If you want to slow down the speed at which you're going, that's way too much. But hopefully your control will be a little bit better. If you have two people. All right, there you go. So that is our snake game. Um, now we will go and move on to the, the final game, which is our piano project. So we're about to begin with chapter four and creating the piano. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that this is one of the most important chapters of the entire series. Um, you learn some essential skills uh, that, that will help advance you into a more of an intermediate programmer and, and getting on to the advanced stage. So some essential questions I want you guys to think about well, um, well before we even get started is what the purpose of a loop or repeating code would be in programming. And then I want you to think about what you would do 
if you had a program and you needed a ton of variables, like a thousand or five thousand variables, say you wanted to save a bunch of passwords, um, how would you be able to do that? Uh, we wouldn't have to create a thousand variables that would just take too long. So we need to figure out a different way of doing that and that's when arrays will come into play. And then what if we want a bunch of objects that have small differences but function very similarly? And if you have, if you actually think about it, we're about to create a piano, um, like a set of piano keys would be a, a ton of objects of the key class and they're not all the exact same. They're not going to work in the exact same way because if you push different buttons on the keyboards, we want different uh, keys getting pressed and we want different sounds coming out of the computer. Uh, we're going to go through a few of these definitions uh, before we get started here. So what is a loop? Um, looping in programming language is a feature that facilitates the execution of a set of instructions repeatedly. And so we will initialize our loop and then we will create while a condition is true, we're going to do the code in the loop and then we're going to update the counter that we're going to have for some of the loops and then we're going to check if that condition is true again and then we'll keep looping around and around. So what is a while loop? A while loop is while some condition is true, we are going to do the statement over and over. Um, a while loop can count, but oftentimes a while loop is used when you don't necessarily know the number of times you want a loop to happen. Uh, you just want it to happen while something is true. Uh, uh, an example I always use with my students is if I have a cup of coffee in my mind the program that's running is while I'm thirsty and while there is coffee in my coffee cup I will drink the coffee. I do not know how many times I will drink the coffee. That is just a condition while I'm thirsty and while the the coffee has the cup has coffee in it. Um, and so I don't know how many times that's going to happen so I will just keep doing it until I'm not thirsty or coffee is empty. Okay, here's a while loop with a counter. And so this is how it would be set up in your code. Int i equals five. So we're starting, we're initializing it here, initializing our i, and that stands for iteration. You'll see i get used a ton in programming um, for loops because it's which iteration it is through the loop. So while i is less than or equal to 10, so it'll start off at five, five less than or equal to 10. Okay, print five and you'll see it prints five. And then it adds one to it, and it makes it six increments up, and it goes to the top of the loop. I is six, less than or equal to 10. Yes, it'll print six, and then it'll change to seven. It'll go through, and it'll keep looping through this, checking if I is less than or equal to 10, adding to I, and printing. Printing, adding to I, checking if less than or equal to 10. Print, add to I, and so on and so forth. So you can see five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 get printed. Um, and that is what a while loop will do for you. Uh, now on to a for loop. Um, the Java for loop is a control flow statement that iterates a part of the program a set number of times. I want you to focus on a set number of times. So our for loop is often called our counter loop. And that is because when you have a set number of times you want something to happen, um, that is more often than not when you're that's when you're going to use the for loop when you're supposed to use the for loop now um i, I use the example of my classroom i have four desks connected and and i'll loop through four times of setting one desk next to another so while my desks are less than four i will go through the loop of setting another ne desk next to the previous desk so here is that same um, image we saw earlier. Check the condition. Is, a, is it the code inside the loop true? Update the counter. And this is where you will definitely have a counter in your counter loop. Um, and then you'll check the condition again. It will repeat. So for loop is set up a little bit different. You will have the word for typed out and then instead of while. And then you'll have, you'll initialize it inside of the loop oftentimes um, saying in i 
equals zero and I equals one maybe, then you'll have a semicolon condition, semicolon, your increment and decrement, okay, and your code to be executed. Um, this is what it looks like in example, and this for an I equals one, I less than or equal to five, I plus plus. So it's kind of like how the while loop had it separated out, initialize it above, condition inside, I plus plus at the bottom, um, excuse me, at the bottom right here. This kind of has it all in the for um, loop here. So in I equals one, I less than or equal to five, I plus plus means that we will start at one. And while I is less than or equal to five, with it adding up at the end, uh, we will print I. So we'll go through, I starts at one, print, print one, and then I plus plus, so I is two. Two is less than five, print, add up. Check, print, add up. Check, print, add up. So here we got one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, now we are gonna talk about an array. Um, and so we, we had mentioned like what we would do if we had a thousand different passwords we needed to save. Um, and so if I wanted to store a thousand passwords in a program, I would not want to create 1,000 individual variables with password one, password two, all the way up to a thousand. We can create an array for that. Okay, so an array holds a list of variables of the same type. So it can hold a list of strings if there are passwords, or a list of integers if I have different numbers I want to store. Um, by declaring an array, memory space is allocated for values of a particular type. At the same, at the time of creation, the length of the array must be specific, specified, and remains constant. So this is important to note. Like you can't change the size of your array halfway through, um, or after you've created it. So an example of an array. So you would create the data type. So int double string boolean and then the name of the array, and then new int string double boolean, whatever the data type is, and then the, the number or the length of the array, the number of values, number of variables you're gonna put in the array. So if I put 10, it would give me zero through nine. So the 10 would be plugged in right here. And then we put the array name again to set, this is how you would set a value in the array the array name, and then brackets, those straight brackets. Notice these are all straight brackets, not curly brackets. Straight bracket, the element number chosen. So if I chose zero, that would be the first one. If I put eight in here, it'd be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would be the element chosen. And then this is the value in the element. So this would be this spot right here. I could have, you know, uh, students names. Maybe that's my array name is student names. And those are all strings. I could have Bill, Bob, Sarah, James, so-and-so all the way up and pick student eight and get their name. Okay, so there's a lot of different, you can see the power this can have. You can create lists of uh, variables. And so here is an example of an array, what it would look like in Java. Um, and so you would, initialize your array by saying the data type, like I said over here, the array name, and then eventually they will set that equal to new int and the number of elements in the array. So this is, once again, the data type and then the number of elements in the array. So there's six elements in the array, so zero through five, and they have set 10, 14, 36, 27, 43, 18 to each one of these locations in the array. And so it's asking to print at location two. So zero, one, two. And so that they would print out 36, would print out at the bottom. Okay. Um, so another benefit and what we're gonna be able to see is how we can use loops and arrays together. Um, so we are gonna create an array of all these keys and we're gonna loop through setting each value of each location in the array to different values that we give it. And we were, were able to access all locations in the array. So we can set values um, within the array by using a loop outside of it. If I wanted user input to set all the students' names in a class, I could have this uh, user 
input every student's name and they would be put at different locations. You can store different patterns in an, an array um, and, and do a lot of things like that. And then you can print the values, you can sort values in an array, and you can also uh, select if a list of, of salesmen reach a certain mark, they get a bonus. Um, this That would be a great example of a selection um, and sorting through an array. So now that we've gone through some of those topics, we're going to begin our piano project and we're going to introduce all of these, these topics as we go. If you have uh, downloaded the scenario below, the piano, we're going to start on the piano project. So open up piano one and be sure to save as uh, your own custom piano. Um, so I'm just going to call it piano game. Okay. In this piano game, uh, we'll have some images already saved in there, but as you can see, there is not much of any code in there. Um, just ready for us to get started with it. So this game was created originally by the author of the Greenfoot textbook. So if you ever want to buy the textbook and get a little bit more information in Greenfoot, um, Michael Calling is the author. Uh, and this is the piano project. So the first thing we need to do with our piano is we need to build the piano. Um, and in our piano, um, you know, in the past, we've possibly just wanted to add in these objects right next to each other and try to make a piano that looks you know, pretty close together and then save the world and all this other stuff. But that really is not the proper way we need to create this game. Um, we want these to be perfectly even, spread apart, lined up exactly right next to each other. Um, so we are going to learn a new concept and that is going to be a loop. And there are two types of loops. There are for loops and while loops. Uh, for loops is normally considered the counter loop. So if we created um, a pair method that will build our world for us, um, we can call prepare into the constructor. And this will not return, no return type here. Um, our prepare method will just add in our objects. Okay, so we need to create a loop, and so there is a for loop, which is considered our counter loop. It's when you know how many times you want something to happen. And in the first portion of our loop, we would want, um, and this would be your starting point, we'll call it. And then in the middle, you're gonna have your condition, and then, and this will happen a certain number of times. So you'll start equaling, let's say zero, and you're gonna say, while this loop is less than 12 in our example, so it starts at zero while it's less than 12, we are going to do this statement and then at the very end, this last part, you can you need to imagine it happening at the very end of the loop. So right after the statements, you have the increment or decrement. Um, but that is gonna be located right up top there. Okay, so let's create this loop here. So um, keep that up there just for a reminder. So four, we'll have int i, um, and that just is the number of instances that have happened in the loop. Um, so it's happened zero times so far, and so that's a common one to start with. And while i is less than 12, less than 12, we will go up by one each time. But when i is less than 12, remember, that's when we go down and do the statements. Okay, so in the curly brackets, we need to do what, do the statements that we want to do. Um, and we are going to uh, need to create a reference to key. Key, key equals new key. And then we are going to add objects key at certain positions. Okay, so our object key would need to be at, and I've already looked this up, 54. And then we want it to be at about 130 for the Y value. OK, 
Okay, now we have our first key there. It's lined up pretty good. Um, the problem is, is we have all of our keys settled right here. Now we want them perfectly distributed evenly all the way across. And so the way we do that is we multiply a number by i. So we're going to add i, which starts at 0, and then it'll go through the loop and add an object key. It added at 54. Then i is 1, and then it adds at 55, and then i is 2. So it'll go through this loop, and it'll happen over and over and over again, increasing i every time. And when i does not, is not less than 12 anymore, it will exit the loop. So right now, it'll happen 12 times. So um, we, if we can manipulate i um, and change the x value based off which one we're adding into the world, and this is very common, manipulating i like this. So i at 0, um, our key will be 54. And then we'll come through the loop and we'll add another key, and i will be 1. And so 54 plus 63 is 107. And then i will be 2, and that'll be 126. And plus 54 will be 180 for the x. And so let me show you, and it'll go all the way across until i is 11 the last time through. And that'll be, uh, what? almost 750, okay, if you do 11 times 63 is, oh, 696 plus 54 is about 750, and so you'll see here we have different keys. When i is 0, it'll be 54, then the next key gets added in, and it'll be 117, next key, 180, and so on and so forth until the last key is at 750 something yeah 747 okay so now we have our keyboard laid out um, ready for us to to start creating so we're going to go into our key now our key class um, we want to create a constructor um, because we are going to have each one of these keys have different property attribute values so each one of these keys needs to be a value on the keyboard. So this would be A, S, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so we are going to keep adding a value, string value, for each one of these. Um, and we're also wanting to have them have a different sound that are associated with, with each one of these keys. And so what we need to do is when first we go into key and we are going to say um, our key needs to have different attributes, what we were just talking about, different fields. So we're going to have a key name that we're going to have to give each one of the keys that we add in. And then we're going to have to have a sound file that we're going to have to give each one of these values. Okay? And so we add that in. Now, there becomes a problem quickly in our piano because when we're adding in these keys, they don't have a string key name or a string sound file. So if we compile, there is an error because it needs a key name. Okay, so if I push G down, um, that'll be my key name. Uh, and then the sound file, we would need to check our sound files. So we would have to look in our piano game and look at the sounds that we have and 3a dot wave we'll do that one okay so that will be our sound so our key will be g and our sound will be 3a dot wave and we have specified that those need to be string values so it, it honestly at, at this point we haven't put any code in um, so it doesn't it, this won't change anything just yet but we are giving a placeholder for the G and 3A. And so um, when we go into our key, now we have a, a value for a key name that is stored uh, as G for all 12 of them and the 3A dot wave for all 12 of them as well. So um, we need to create a way for our key class to be able to receive 
this key name um, and this sound file that we have given it. So these are connected um, to this object, but they are not connected and referenced from the key class. The specific objects can see the keys, but the entire class can't. So the code that is going in the whole class cannot see the, this key. Okay, so we need to create a way for it to see the key. Um, so we are going to create a string, just key, and a string sound. And so we are going to set our key, our local variable key, equal to key name. And our local variable sound equal to sound file. Now, because these are strings that get entered in, so now that our g and our 3a.wave are set for each object as their key name and their sound file, whenever we plug key in the rest of the way, it will be receiving whatever is plugged in here, and for the sound, it'll receive whatever is plugged in here, which right now is just g, but eventually we're going to replace this G with every key on the home row, on the middle row of the keyboard. And so that way you'll be able to type in um, the letters and it will receive different letters. So right now key is set to basically G because we did that in here. And our sound file is set to 3a.wave. Okay, so we're going to need to create a way to um, say um, that the keys are pushed down, and we're going to need to create a way to make sound. Okay, so um, if we have a public void key pressed, we are, we'll say if greenfoot dot is key down g. The G key is down. We are going to set our image to white key down dot PNG. So this is a file. I'll make sure this is a string. That this will access our files in our folder. I've created this white key down folder. And this set image will use the white key down image um, that we have. We set image and look at our images. We have black key down, white key down, um, and we'll eventually add black keys onto this keyboard. Okay, and then the background. So um, now, if greenfoot dot is key down. the image should change. Okay, now it's stuck. Um, it does change, but it's stuck. So we need to say, create a Boolean is pressed. So that'll be false. And is pressed is false. So you can just put an exclamation point at the front of that. They'll know um, and now we're going to have multiple lines in this if statement. And so we will um, change is pressed from false, because the default is false, uh, to true. Okay. And then when we push down, quickly show you. It still won't switch back, but it's ready to switch back. And I'll show you what I mean right here. So um, if greenfoot dot is key down, so if G is not pushed down, since we have the exclamation point, um, and is pressed is true, so you just need to put is, tr is pressed, we're going to set our image to white key dot png.
and then we will set our is pressed equals false. Okay, now if we push G down and let go, it switches back and forth, and you can put on a good light show right there. Um, but we need to have some sound come out. So um, first, I want to make sure I got some sound on my screen here. Um, if we go in here, we are going to need to uh, public void play sound. And we will greenfoot dot and we can do control space to see greenfoot does have a play sound feature and so our sound play sound will be sound and excuse me our sound will be 3a dot wave um, in quotes because it is a string and now play and put it in the act method. Ah, ah. Excuse me, don't put it in the act method. We're gonna put it if, because I would do it over and over and over again. We wanna do it if uh, is key down G and is press is false. So just do it once. And so if you notice there, uh, there was multiple keys that were getting pushed at multiple times and it, it kind of was was a little bit slow um, because we're trying to do all of these keys all at once so they obviously all made that sound um, and so what we want to do is make it so that this value changes for each one of these um, keys that we add in and so instead of having to go in and, and hard code 12 keys, I mean, what if we wanted a whole piano and then and then we wanted a gigantic multi-level piano? I mean, it, it would just take forever if we kept trying to add hard code keys in. Um, and so as of now, it is just equal to G. And so since we are accessing these uh, parameters, we want to switch these to key, key, and then play sound should just play not 3a.wave, but sound. Now, this will still be G and 3A.Wave, and I want to make a point of that. Um, so when we push G, it's still 3A.Wave, and G is pushing for all the sounds. But that is because of what we have in here. Okay, so in our world class, when we add these objects in, each one of them have a value of G and 3A.Wave. We are going to have to create what we call an array. And an array uh, is the ability to store a group of values, a list of values. So the, this array will allow us to store multiple values for this location. And so we'll have a list of, of, of 12 different strings, which are all the keys on the keyboard. So A, S, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, semicolon all the way through um, and this will give us the opportunity to um, store multiple values so we're going to do public string and so we are um, we don't have to have public um, necessarily but it would be nice if this was accessible for multiple classes um, but just to prove that you don't need it um, you can do string and then to show that it will be a, uh, an array you need to have these brackets without not curly brackets, just regular brackets, uh, and you need to name it. So this will be our key names, and then that will equal, and you put a curly bracket to start, and then you can just create a list of strings, and that will be all the way across our keyboard. And our 11th will be bracket. We'll have to go up and to the right for that last one. Okay. So then we need a semicolon at the end, signifying the end of our string. Um, and then we're going to also need a string for sound files. And the sound files are shown. So I have the name of all the sound files here. Um, I'm going to do a, 
the dot wave um, down when we actually are plugging these in. And so I'm just going to have 2A Okay, then you close it off, semicolon. We have a full, it looks a little more like this. So now we can, we have different va variables here, or different values, excuse me, for our string key names. And so key names has 12 different values here, and the key names at zero would be A. And at one, it would be S, and two, and three, four, five, all the way up to 11. Um, this is called the index, and the value of this number inside of key names um, will have to be written like this. So if you wanted to get the A, you'd have to write key names zero. So this key name zero would say, oh, I want the A, I want the zero spot. Um, for the key names array. Then if it was four, I would go zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, it's G. So if I put key names four here, names four here, it would still work for G. Okay, but that's not what we're looking for either. We want this to be every single key and not just that. We want it to be going across the screen and so our furthest one to the left needs to be A and then the next one in should be S and then D. Well, we already have that set up. So when I is zero, that is the location I want my A key, right here, right on this first one should be the A. And then for S, it needs to be the second one, which the second key happens to be when I is one, and so it's 54 plus one times 63. So that goes on and so on and so forth. So each one um, needs to be each value in here. And so it, it works very well in this example that you can just plug in I here and A at zero the first time through the loop key names will I will be zero so it will grab A and it'll put A the A key at 54 and then the next time through the loop I will be one so we'll grab S because S, T, I would be one. So we'd grab S and then we'd add in the S key name um, when I is one. So one times 63 plus 54 is 117. And that would go on so on and so forth all the way down till the last one. That's a common error, uh, array index out of bounds, exception 11. That just means it has gone outside the bounds, uh, the boundaries of the array that you've created. So somehow we've messed up. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We need a twelfth key. That's our problem. Okay, so that'll be the right bracket. Now we compile and we exit out of this, and our loop is made. So if I push like L, it'll make the same noise, but L was this one, right? This one is L, still 3A dot wave, but my X value is 558. And that is because L is zero when I is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the eighth key that they add in I is 7, 7 times 63 plus 54 is that value that we just got, I forgot, 550 something. Um, 
and it will be, i will be 7, so it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, excuse me, 8, and so this would be 8 times 63, um, and now we can get all the keys on the keyboard, but if you notice, it's the same sound going along. Okay, so now we need to do the same thing with the sound file. And we have sound files. And that will want to match up. 2A should be the first time, first spot in the array or the zero index. So when sound files I. So when it's zero, the first time through the loop, it'll be 2A. And it'll be I for the key name right here. So this would also be zero, okay? Um, now, we don't want just a white key down, okay? We also want to have a different state. Um, so, so fields that we put in here can represent different attributes that the key, that the object, the key object has, and also the different states that it can be in. So we are going to have a new state that it can be in that will be the key getting pushed down or the key not getting pushed down and the key is up. So uh, key it will be up image and then we're going to have our down image. Okay, and th this up image and down image um, will need to be saved in. And so we're going to have a white key and a black key. So we just want a general, if no key is pushed, the up image will be for all of them. If a key is pushed, we want to change it to the down image, whether it's a white key or a black key. So these are the states at which our keys could possibly be in. Okay, and so what this does is makes it so that we need to be able to save, just like we did with the key names and the sound file, we need to be able to save this to the class. This, these objects are going to be able to get the up image and down image, but is our class going to be able to save it or access it or store it? No. Okay, so once we add in, so we need to go back in, and this key name, when we add this key in, there's going to be an issue. They need to have, they have one, two, three, four strings required, but they found only one, two strings. So they differ, They're, they differ in length. Okay, and the problem is, is that we want the white key, the white key up and the white key down, uh, up image. So white key, up dot png and then white I think it's just white key dot png not white key up so white key dot png and then we need the white key down dot png okay so now the two states that the key is going to be in is either up or down and that way when we have String up image. We'll say actually we'll save it as the same name, and um, this will be a little bit confusing, but it also explains something here. So our up image will equal our up image. Uh oh. So how are we going to clear this up on which is which? Okay, you can reference this specific object, the specific object that you're in um, and do this dot up image uh, will equal up image and that way when you reference it in the class it'll know which up image you're talking about you're talking about this up image okay and then this excuse me is going to be down image when we push down and this will be up image okay so we need to do the same thing with string down image this dot down image equals the parameter down image 
Okay, so here we, we could have just renamed this something different, but this the this dot up image and this dot down image just is evidence of using the this uh, keyword, which is nice to, to know. Okay, um, and so down image and up image. So this should have the same experience that we had before. So this needs the plus dot wave. And now you have different sounds. So let's test that out. Okay, so the keys are a little bit off on the, the actual notes, but I will edit that at the end. Um, so just hold tight, um, keep, it, keep it there for now. Uh, it's still, still making different sounds, which is great. So the white key dot PNG and the white key down dot PNG um, makes it so that these are should not be hard coded in because now we're able to do something else. We're able to make black keys, so keys that are a different image that work uh, slightly, have slightly different values but work in the same way. So we don't need to create a new class called black keys. We can just use our key names uh, and sound files and the image instead of it being a white key dot png will make it a black key and a black key down image um, to change the state of our new key objects okay so we are going to create a second for loop and have int i equals zero and what we're actually going to do is we're going to reference the length of the key names so I is less than key names dot length and then I plus plus. Okay, so you could actually go back and, and do that now and you could do key names dot length and so this will be 12 because there are 12 strings in the array and so this grabs the length of it and um, this is common with loops to start at zero and do less than the length of something because that will grab index zero through the last index in the array. So that's very common to find the length of the array. Start at zero and do less than the length of the array because that means you're checking every single spot in the array and that's what we're trying to do here. So um, when we're adding in the black keys, um, we're still gonna create a uh, key, but we want to make it a different variable name. So we're going to B key is going to be a new key and We need to create a new array with different sound files for our string um, Black keys And this should probably be white keys instead and this should be white key sound files do white key sounds and black key sounds okay so this would be still white key sounds white keys and we're back to it okay um, so when we add in these keys they need to have a different image and uh, image for being down so our it will still be black keys because we want different buttons uh, to be hit in order to reference them and so we need to finish the array here um, and we will add in U, I, O, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's do, and we're running out of letters. So we're going to end it there. Okay, and we'll make eight keys here. Don't forget the equal sign. Okay, um, string, black key sounds and I will add in the sounds here in a moment Three, eight.
Okay, so the key names, uh, it should not be key names dot length. Now it is going to be white keys dot length and black keys dot length. Okay, um, uh, so this would only go up to nine um, and it would start at zero and actually end at eight. So that would be zero through eight, so that would be nine. And we're gonna do black key sounds i plus dot wave comma black key dot png comma black key key down dot Okay. Oops. Parentheses, semicolon. Okay. So we've created it, but now we need to actually add the object in. Uh, similar to what we did here. B key, comma. Um, now we're going to add it at 54 plus i times 63. We're actually going to start at 86, not 54. Uh, comma 86 here as well for the y value. Okay, um, but we don't want our black keys to always show up and we want to make sure the up image and the down image are getting pushed. So let's go ahead and test what we have so far. So if you play Oh, these turn into black keys when we play them, but we cannot open file dot wave. Did we forget the dot wave on this? Um, also I have changed the values up here for the white sounds and the black key sounds to get the correct um, the correct uh, strings in there, um, the correct files. Okay, so we need to make sure this dot wave is done correctly. Looks like it is. Um, ah, here's the problem. There's no blank dot wave, so there's no nothing dot wave. So we need to only add this in because we want some spaces in our piano. Um, the black keys are not on ev after every single. So we're going to say if our black keys I, so if the black keys that we've chosen in the array does not exclamation point equal null, uh, blank, then we will then add keys in. So only once this does not equal the space, that's the only time we'll add the keys in. Black key sounds, that's what we need to check. If that is equal to nothing. Okay. And so now we have our spaces. R doesn't do anything. Cool. Um, so we want to add one more in at the end. And so let's add after. So let's change our piano uh, up a little bit. So instead of this one um, having this up bracket, let's have it be just the quote. And so that'll be right beneath it, um, and that'll be on the same line, and then we'll go up to the very last white key on the end, and then we can add in a black key. That'll give us one more. Um, that'll be a bracket. And then we can add in another sound for it. Um, and that can be, and that can be 4F sharp. And that will close us out. Now, this air out of the way. We have one more on the end. And 
that gives us a pretty full piano. Um, if we want to add in more, more pianos on the end, and we, we actually would want a blank here. Um, so So we actually kind of want to blank uh, and then the 4F. So we're going to create two more. So we're going to have this be um, nothing and then give a space also here. And that will make this not show up because there is also a space in this spot in the array. And then at the very end, we'll, we'll do that close bracket or open bracket right there. Okay, so now we have Now, why is it turning? Why is it? Why isn't it starting? Um, so we would need to look at how when our key gets entered in. So in the constructor, that's right when the key gets entered in. What is happening? Well, our up image will always start at what it sees at the 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 top. Sees first, and what it sees first, what it reads first is these white keys, and it adds in twelve of them, and then it goes to the black keys, and it will add in the black keys, um, but the up image um, starts off equaling the white key. So we need to make sure that the up image is set. We're going to set our image to our up image, um, grabbing that from this code right here. Um, and then now it starts out from the beginning equaling the correct key, okay? And actually, it knows that up image cannot be accessed directly. We wanna make sure up image is counted in right there, okay? And then we have our, I wish I had, I knew a song. Um, that's about it, and that's in the wrong key. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, it helped teach you guys a little bit more about arrays that we have created up here, which can store lists of things. So like all of the white keys, and then we are able to hold all of the sounds for the white keys and all of the black keys and all of the sounds for the black keys, um, as well as loops and kind of how to manipulate a loop uh, in a way that it can, can count through and cycle through an array. So this loop, we created, added all the keys in, and it was also able to cycle through every value that was within the array. Um, and then we had our black keys as well, and that's another loop. Um, and so we also were, did a lot with fields and um, understanding that these are the properties and the characteristics of the object, of the key object, and, and that, that is a very powerful thing. Um, you can change the look. You can change um, a lot of just characteristics and traits of the key based off what you have in these fields. So it's important to be able to use those and manipulate them. And we haven't really done that um, to an extreme level yet until this, this assignment. Congratulations. You've completed the course. I uh, hope you guys really enjoyed it. Uh, feel free to leave comments below with any questions. Uh, subscribe to my channel if you enjoyed it. And... Uh, if you guys have any games you want to show off in the future, go ahead and post on the comments below. So um, I'm going to leave you guys with one last project, um, and this will be our Frogger game, and it'll teach you uh, two-dimensional arrays. You can have arrays within arrays. So if you want to keep going, uh, the last activity that is kind of an advanced extra credit, we'll call it activity, uh, is the Frogger game, and that'll be up right after this. So thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. All right, I'm going to give another go on the Frogger game. Um, that's why we call it Frogger 2 here. Um, first time I was recording my face. I'm new to live streaming. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to create a map. And first we need to create a multi or two-dimensional array <clears throat> that we're going to call map. And this two-dimensional array will have different values in it. And so starting off, I need to make it... I'm gonna make it 16 
by 16. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Close curly bracket, comma, and then it is going to be 16 rows along with that. Three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Whew. That is a lot. And the last one will have two curly brackets and a semicolon. The first one should have two curly brackets. And the reason that it has two curly brackets is because I know these are on different lines, but essentially this is an array of sixteen arrays with 16 elements. So the two-dimensional array is an array that starts he starts here and then it holds one, two, three, all 16 arrays. <laughs> okay? So um, in order to build this map of our Frogger game, um, we're gonna just start with with kind of giving a demonstration of, of uh, how to access different areas. So if map zero, zero equals equals the value zero. So this is getting the location in row zero, column zero. Um, let's make it one zero so we can really look at it. We're going to add an object in, so we need to make make an object available to us. And our first one's just going to be our image, and that's going to be multiple different images in our game. Um, but we will make our frog here in a moment. Um, but just an image could be a background image of some sandy beach. So um, our frog's trying to get across the street, over the beach across the pond to the other beach where he will have freedom. Okay, so we have our my image. So we're gonna add object new image comma and this is where well to start off we can start off with zero comma zero. Okay. So we have our object added in at zero, zero. Um, if our world is um, 16 by 16, that if there is just, if they're one pixel apart, um, it would just be 16 pixels by 16 pixels. Um, so there's a lot of different things we could do, but for our map in a Frogger game, we're gonna have blocks that are gonna be about 50 by 50 pixels apart. And so what we need to do within our image um, is going to create a constructor. And we're going to have this image. We're going to get the image, and we're going to scale it down. And we can scale it to a specific size. So we want it to be a 50 by 50 size. So that will make this a lot different. Okay, and the actual location of it at 0, 0 will be up and to the left, so it'll be a little bit outside of the wall, which is fine. Okay, um, so now we need to go back into our my world, and we need to test and make sure we know where one zero is. So this would be zero zero. So is this one zero? Well, we'll find out if this doesn't show up an image, and it does. So this must be our one zero. So realize that it goes down or counts to the next array. So it chooses the array first, and then it chooses the location in the array with the second. Okay, so that's a good way to know kind of how a two dimensional array works. Is that first it picks the array, so that it'll be not the first array but the second array, so this would be array zero, because it starts at zero, and this would be array one, 
and then we're going to be location zero in array one. Okay, so then when we go back up, it's not there. Okay, so let's change this back to zero and zero. So let's say we wanted to grab all 16 arrays and we wanted to also grab the 16 elements within that array. Okay, so in order to grab first the elements, we would need to have a loop that went 16 times, i equals zero, and i equals zero, i less than 16, i plus plus. Okay, that will give us That will have it go through this exact spot 16 times. So kind of a waste of time if we go through that spot. But if we changed this to i and then made our x value i and our y value 0, you know, I wonder what it would do. Well, <laughs> our y value, our x value needs to be i times 50 because remember, like we said, it's only moving over. 16 pixels and so we want it to be 50 the 50 by 50 fill every single spot in the array and so what we first need to do is since it's 16 by 16 we are going to make our world 800 by 800 um, which will give us 16 different 50 by 50 pixels that we can fit in because 16 times 50 would be 800 so now we will see our frog world's a lot bigger. Um, and if we just move these apart at all, they immediately, they're barely touching together. So you can really see how they're lined up perfectly for us. And that's what we want, ideally. And so um, the only issue is in our my world, um, we actually don't need to be 800. We need to just be 750. Because our first our first image will be a little bit overlapping into the wall. And so we don't really need it to be all the way to 850, 750 will be fine. And going down, it will be the same way. So in order to fill this going down now, let's do control shift I, line it up a little bit. But in order for this um, to get all 16 of these arrays, we need to do int j equals zero. Actually, let's do, since these are the arrays, so these would be the rows, and this can be column. Column row. And then this was column. So which array is picked first? And then which element within the array is picked second? Okay, so row is less than 16. And then row plus plus. This needs to be call. Column. Okay, control, command, shift, I. Now we have a loop within a loop and an if statement that is I that is having some issues. So this would be um, the I, which would be a column for the X value, okay? Because if we're in column one, this might keep moving over on us, but for visual purposes, it might be best still. So, Row will pick the array that we're in. Column will pick what element within the array. So the first column row should pick the array. And column should pick the element within the array. So row. So it's, I know it's a little bit strange watching these flip in order, but that's that's how it's supposed to be, okay? Um, so this will pick the element, this will 
pick the row. Now we have a full picture that has objects perfectly placed all over the board. So that's how we set up the beginning of our map. Okay, um, and so you can change it up just by doing an else if map row column equals equals one and then equals equals two and then three and then four. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that started for us. And I know that the, we could do a switch statement. So if you wanna look up how to do a switch statement and you wanna do it that way, um, go for it. It's a, it's a great, great idea and I would do it if we had time. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't do switch statements all the time. So. Um, I'll just do it else if it's not that big a deal. Okay, so um, we are going to add a different object. Now, we are going to still do an image, um, but we can't do the same image. So, how can we change the image? The image, we still want it to be just a background, and we want it to you know, not really have much, much movement, but we want to change the picture. And so how we can do that is we can, what we call um, cr create a parameter and pass some information to the image saying which image name we want. So we're going to call it string image name. Okay. Now that is a way that this object can receive image name. It cannot store image name at this point. So we need to create a variable so it can store image name. I can name this image. And then I could say image equals image name. And then we would set image to image. But oftentimes you'll see it as the same name and we will do this dot image name so we know that we're talking about this keyword is re referencing um, <clears throat> this specific object this specific instance so now image is like oh shoot well you said you expect a string name and that string name is going to have to be the image that we're talking about so sand 2jpg believe is what we need and then wet blue dot jpeg and a probably probably one of them for some crazy reason okay maybe this is slower all right now we're good. Now we're good. Now I threw that in. I don't need it. And one more. Oh. So now if I put in one anywhere in my map, you can start us start seeing me build the map. So if I put one anywhere in the map, um, it should turn it blue. So we can just test this real quick. Ugh, wet blue dot PNG. Darn it. So PNG.
just doing some testing to make sure you guys can see what I see. Okay, good. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, because I screwed up last time, like I said. So, um, now, when we change that to .png, compile, create a new world. <laughs> Let's try reopening this. That's what the end product will look like. Mm, what blue dot png is the problem? So we need to take a look at. Ah, shoot. So we just need to load this image in. And then change it to JPG. And of course, I've already done that and had that mistake before, but now you can see. Okay, so it's 11111. Okay. Um, and if I did one, one here, we'd add in our water. Okay. And so now we're going to go to add object, copy and paste. And this time, I'm going to make sure the file is actually available to me. So in this one in particular, I actually have this saved. I created, I found a, a road that I use. Um, and this road.png is able to be used um, and I scaled it I'm scaling it down to 50 by 50 so it really just needs to be pretty square for it to work very well um, the more square it is the better and now wherever there's a two should be some road perfect okay and they're basically the same size yeah okay so that's a great way to start. And now we need to make our map. So I'm gonna go ahead and make the map as quickly as I can here for you. Do some copy and pasting. Okay, comma one. Paste, All right, there we go. Now you can just go copy. Paste. Okay. Then we can go two comma two. Copy. Paste. Paste. And then. Oops. You can see our map come to life. And plus this is a little fun to do it this way. Okay, as opposed to trying to add in these objects in such a particular way. And where do you want to put them? All this stuff. Okay, so we got our road that we're gonna need to be able to cross. Right here, you got a six lane highway right here. A little safety area, and then we got our water. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make up my water one more. And here we go. All right, now let's go ahead and create a new animal frog. We'll call it the frog. Everyone knows what the frog's doing. It could be a player. The frog is its own beast. And so, in my my world, I'm going to say, um, 
I could probably just add an object. So instead of making a whole different if statement to check, we could probably just add object frog at, let's see, this would be 50, 100, 200, 300, 400 would be about the middle. Okay, at, let's say 375, which would be the middle, and the Y value would be almost 750, but not quite. So let's do 710 and see how this does for us. New frog, new keyword to create an object. Here we go. It's a great place for our frog to start. So we have a frog. Um, we have a water, we have a road, we have our sand, so we have all the different images. But actually, we're gonna change water at some point here. Actually, let's just go ahead and do that right now. So our our enemies in this game, <clears throat> excuse me, our enemies in this game are going to be multiple. So we're going to have um, transport, okay, an ambulance. We're going to have, um, a green car, we're going to have a blue car, all facing to the right, because um, that's the way our road's facing. We don't want anything to be screwed up there. And then water is going to be our other enemy. And so our enemy is also going to need to have a name. So we're going to pass a name to our enemy through a parameter. Um, and a constructor, which is the method, that constructor method, the public name of the class, um, enemy name, string, enemy name, uh, this dot enemy name equals enemy name that is getting passed. So this one matches with this one, and this one is for this instance, let me name. Um, then we're going to set our image to this dot, let me name. And we're gonna get the image and make sure that that is scaled down. And for our enemies, that will be scaled down to 50-50. Yeah, let's give them a little bit of room. Let's give them a little bit of room to just kind of move around. Um, so they're not all the way covering. And so now we're going to need to have else if. And we're actually going to have to have curly brackets on this one because we're going to have more than one. We're going to add in an image. So we're going to add objects. wet blue enemy whoops so now wet blue is not going to be an image but it's going to be an enemy and so we want this also to be an enemy here because when our frog touches the water, we, we need to lose. So it needs to be an enemy in our game. As opposed to the road, it's just an image in the background of the sand. It's just an image in the background. And you can see we can't have our image scale down to 45-45. Or it'll look like a crazy grid on our screen. And we can't have that. Okay, so we're just going to have to leave it as it is, which is fine. This is how I've done it before. So, um... In our my world, now if add object new, um, well, this is going to be in our water. So if we're adding object into our water, we need to have something that can carry us in the water. And so this will not be an enemy, this will be a new class that we're gonna call raft. And our raft 
will be um, a boat. Our raft will be, um, uh, let's choose the other boat. So we'll choose, we'll choose this boat. Yeah, why not? Okay, so it's facing left. And then our turtles we're gonna have, which will be there for us to jump on as the frog uh, facing right. And so in the past I've, uh, found an image online for a log. That's also a great one to use. Um, but we are going to have our water enemy and then our raft. And just like the other ones, once again, we're going to need to make a string raft name. And we're going to need to make a constructor that will be able to pass a string raft name in that we give it. So these do not relate to each other yet. They, although they have the same name, this one's getting passed to it. This one's ready to store what we're about to pass to it, essentially. So this dot raft name equals the raft name that's getting passed to us in the parameter. Um, and then we are going to set image to this dot raft name. And then we're going to get image and make sure that this is dot scale the image to 50, 50. So raft, oh, great. What is the boat called? Rock the boat, rock the boat. Boat one, easy. Okay, boat one and then turtle two. So those are our two types of rafts. So raft. Boat one. Was it a one? Shoot. I remember. Yes, it was. Okay. Good thing I didn't change it. Boat. O one dot PNG. Column times fifty, comma. Row times fifty. Um, then we're basically doing the same thing. So I'm just going to copy and paste there and then a four, then it's not boat, but turtle two, turtle two. All right. Now we have our threes and fours. So that will go into our rafts. So our threes are our boats. Three, 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 and three, three. There we have. You guys can test these and edit these how you'd like. somewhat of a pattern but also it's all fun it's all fun it doesn't necessarily matter um, you also don't want it to be too easy so I'm gonna change up the patterns a little bit so that helps make it a little harder the further along we get here so, one, two, three, spaces, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then we will have three, 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 three. Three. 
And then actually this last line, I'm gonna make another um, sand because you'll see the sand will cut off over there. Whoa, okay, for some reason, we're doing road. I guess I didn't make my edits down there. Raft turtle.png should be four. Oh, shoot. I've been plugging in twos. Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. I apologize for that. That was a mistake. Silly mistakes. They will happen. I'll work through them. All right. Now we're good. Now let's see how it looks. Much better. Okay. And so what we're going to have is these turtles go to the right. These ships go to the left. And you're going to try to move, maneuver your way across um, as the frog. And first you're going to have to avoid some enemy cars that we're going to add in. So we go back into my world. Our enemies are set up and good to go. So we just need to start building them. And so um, we'll start, we'll build the first one right here. So this can be five. And we need multiple. We don't have to add in more than one because we need to add back in our road as well. So we're going to add object new enemy and car one dot car two dot png uh, i think it's car one dot png dot png oh, come on. times 50 Whoa. because this is like depending on what location this would be like location 16 as the max 16 as the max for the x value and then two for the y or 15. Um, the, this would be 15 column, yeah, for the x value, column 15 multiplied by 50. That's why we're multiplying by 50, because these locations are 0 through 15. And so that is why we need to multiply by 50. We're going to take that. We're not going to create the same thing, but we are going to try to save a second by adding a new image road.png okay so now if i would have tested that and thrown a five or two in there five 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 take a peek at how that looks and since it compiled it seems like i think i think it actually worked okay um, we just need to set a paint order and so that it's visible. The right things are visible. And so the first thing that obviously needs to always be shown is the frog. That needs to be on top of everything else. Um, then the next thing that should be on top of everything else would be the enemies on top of the images. And uh, no, actually the rafts need to be on top raft.class needs to make sure it's on top of the water and then the enemy can be on top of the images everything else essentially <clears throat> now we have our cars now they're a little short short cars um because we're making them 50 by 50 um but I, I like it that way too so um now we just need to do that for multiple different types of cars so we can copy Paste, paste, and then we can have our six and seven be the other cars. Now I skipped one of the cars, so I think I'm car one and three, yeah. And then ambulance.png. Okay, so car one and car three, and then ambulance.png. Now we just start throwing them in there, however you like. So six, seven, six, five, six, 
six, seven, seven, six, five. Now we are going to have these move a little bit random, whereas the ships will move more consistently. The enemies, um, besides the water, of course, will move randomly. The water will not move. Um, just be unnecessary and too many things moving. So, as we round this out, we want to make sure that the first one is not too easy. I always seem to make too many, so I want to make sure it is a pretty good. See, it's going to be pretty tough. So I'm going to two, 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 two. Okay, now let's get rid of a blue in the first row. Go a blue in the first row. We'll go two blues in the first row. Make the first row nice and easy for us. All right. Now we're good. Okay, sweet. So, um, our enemies. Now we're going to do, in the act method, we are going to have our rafts move a certain way, and we're going to have our enemies move a certain way. So our rafts, if we're going to create a variable count, first int count equals zero. Count plus plus. Count will just count up. If count modulo, oh, we'll do 20 equals equals zero. So that means every time count gets to be divisible by 20. So at 20, 40, 60, whenever the remainder is zero. That's what this modulo does. So if I changed it to one, if it was 21, 41, 61, all of those have a remainder of one when I divide by 20. So that's what that does. Um, and we can ask what this dot raft name if that equals equals, um, let's see, boat 01.png. So if it's the boat, we're going to go a certain direction. Set our location, get x. Our boat's going to the left, so minus. Oh, we're going to have to move pretty good. 20, get Y. Now we can test that. And I just put this in the act method. There's not going to be much action going on for these guys. Um, oh, that's that's nice. I like it. I like it. Okay. So um, we need to have otherwise, if our raft, the We want 20. We're, we're going to have them each move similar. So we're going to copy and paste. Put turtle. Um, plus 20 because it's facing the other way. Now you can always have speed and change speed from positive to negative depending on what raft name is. So there's different ways you can do it. Um, and I must not have done that correctly. Turtle 2. Okay. Turtle 2 is the name. So now the turtles move. Okay. Now we need them to wrap. So our raft. We need them to wrap. So if x is equal to 0. We are going to set our location. 
to get world dot get with minus two. Now this minus two, I'll tell you about it in a second, but basically it's going to make it so that you don't get stuck on the edge. So if get x equals equals get world dot get with minus one, that would be the very far right side of the world. And so we would set our location back to one get y instead of back to zero because if we relocated it back to zero then it would read it as zero and relocate it back to get with and if this was minus one then it would relocate it back and forth and it'd be stuck in limbo and we don't want that okay so now oh we got our boats wrapping okay got our turtles moving now they're gonna at times they're gonna get stacked on top of each other a little bit and move a little bit forward a little bit back really not a big issue for us here um, because we're trying to land on either of them. Um, and the reason it's doing that is because they're moving only 20 at a time. So they're not always teleporting to the other side, reaching the right side the same time as reaching the left side or same, same time as their counterpart behind them. But we got the main part moving. So now our enemies will use a similar counts um they're going to be moving to the right so we'll use this one we'll do that we'll do this we'll do enemy have its own counts and count plus plus this dot not raft name and if that equals you know what, we don't even need this. All of our enemies are gonna be moving on their own. So we're going to get random numbers so they're not all moving the same. So greenfoot.getRandom number will give us a random whole number between zero and one less than whatever we put in. So we'll put 20. Eh, but 30. This will move them a little more sporadically. And then I'll do green foot get random number 30 again here. And we'll see how that works for us. Okay. So, whoops. Wet blue. Ah. And that's right. This dot enemy name does not equal blue, wet dash blue dot jpeg okay so we don't want it to equal okay see how this does for us see if this works out oh can't divide it by zero no. um so you need to plus one to that to make sure that it is dividing by plus something positive because this goes zero to 29 can't divide by zero okay and now you see these guys moving randomly they also need a rapid edge so This if statement actually doesn't need curly brackets. Um, okay. Whoops. All right, now we're good. So now let's watch us move and wrap. Cars can run into each other even. Do a bunch of crazy stuff. Okay, so we got different cars moving at different speeds. I like it. Now we need our frog to be able to move. So our frog has no code in it. So our frog is going to have some simple move around code. And finally, I'm doing some more proper 
programming by creating a method for I should have, but I'm trying to go fast here. If greenfoot dot get um, is key down uh, a, then we will set our location to get x, and we're going left, so minus five and get y will be the same okay and we can copy this and paste 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 and go let's do d for the right and do positive if we do minus Five, it would have to be going up towards the, top of the screen or zero, y is zero. And if we are going down, we want to add five. So WASD. Okay. Now that we have the move around, we need to call it into the back method. Um, and then we need to have a public void you when lose first uh, so if is touching enemy dot class and our enemy class is our cars and our water and so if it's touching our enemy class and is not touching um our raft which is safety, remember? Then, if it's touching an enemy and not touching a raft, then we need to get world dot show text you lose. Make sure it's obnoxious. And let's put it at oh the middle, which is like 350. Do get world dot get with divided by two if I wanted to. Um, 50. Okay. And then greenfoot dot stop, but there's more than one command in there, so we put curly brackets to close it off. Control shift I. Okay. Now, if we run it and we run into somebody, uh oh. Didn't put in the act method. <laughs> you can tell that if everything compiled correctly and you feel like you did it right, you probably didn't put it in the act method. Very common. Okay, let's try this a second time. You lose pops up. Okay, 350 isn't actually right, so I actually am going to change it to get world dot get with divided by two. Okay. Um, all right, sweet, and you lose. And let's make it so you win. Um, you win. And let's go ahead and throw that in the act method right now. If um, get y is less than, um, this is 50, probably 60. It's less than 60. I've actually tested it. I believe 60 is right. Um, get world dot show text. You win. Now, if you want to go through a different um, lesson to learn how to make a better you win screen, I do have those. Feel free to check it out. Um, but 50 for now, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to also do a greenfoot.stop our program. Um, excellent. You win. Um, I'm also going to make our frog quite a bit smaller, public, so you don't have to always scale it up also scale it down so we can just do we already have the image but we can do um, get image 
dot scale the image to I mean we can scale it down pretty low 25 now let's see 30 30 and then now we have a smaller frog that we can maneuver and hang out there if we need to we can jump across oh be careful ah See if we can't get across here in a second. We don't have to cheat my way through. Come on now. Better than that. Better than that, Tanner. All right. Um, all right, now we're to the ships. I think this will be a little bit easier for us. Woohoo! We won the game. All right, very cool. Well, I'm glad you watched and followed along. Um, until next time.